Hey folks, and welcome to the Daily Ratings Podcast. It's a show where each week, we'll sit down with Vincent Daly to get his thoughts on the latest movies he's been watching, both older films and new releases. And don't worry, there's no spoilers. Vince will give a brief review of the movie, share some thoughts, and of course, then rate the film. The Daily Ratings are always fair, honest, and most importantly, they're consistent. On today's show, Vin will be rating and reviewing Paris, Texas by Wim Wenders, If Beale Street Could Talk by Barry Jenkins, We Have Newly Released Leave the World Behind by Sam Esmail, Eileen by William Oldroyd, and finally, The Boy and the Heron, directed by Hayao Miyazaki. So it's going to be a great show, folks. Stay tuned and enjoy. Daily, how we doing, buddy? Hey, Tommy, how's it going? Oh, boy, there, there it is. Again. <laughs> there, there I am. I just never <laughs> learned my lesson. I just never learned my lesson. Go All right, there you go. Now you sound a little bit better. <laughs> how was your week of movies, man? Oh boy, uh, a week I had to work for. Really? I'll tell you what, this, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nearly all of these, all of these uh, were not simple movies to cover. Uh, you know, <laughs> each one was uh, was a challenge uh, in a, a okay. lot of different right. ways. So uh, it was not like a. Uh, I'll give you <laughs> a recent week that came to mind. It wasn't like the Hunger Games week where I was just trying to see who you know Jennifer Lawrence was going to kiss at right, the end. Right. Was it country boyfriend or psyops <laughs> boyfriend? <laughs> Uh, this week, uh, uh, almost every one of these movies needed like a whole day of uh, thinking about the notes and and really refining what I wanted to say. Okay, uh, which is good. Uh, I'm happy, but uh, you know, you were working. Uh, you were working. <laughs> it was it was a working week. <laughs> okay, before we started, you said you were dying to know what I watched. Yes, you're yes, dying yes, to know yeah, what I watched. Yeah, I was I was really trying not to <laughs> ask you what you watched. I'll tell you right now. Yeah. Okay, so I watched The Boy and the Heron. Okay, all right. Watched it by myself Monday, <laughs> Monday night at at a freaking movie tavern. Oh, wow. But I got that good. The movie tavern has one decent theater, apparently. Okay. Because I always bitch about the, the size <laughs> yeah, of yeah, the yeah. screen and the sound. Yeah. This one, the screen size was fine, and the sound was actually pretty good. Oh, okay. It was nice, in their nice. special, not DTX, their Atmos Theater, mm. whatever that was. Mm. Uh, so movie experience, movie watching experience, pretty mm. good for The Boy and the Heron. Yeah, a good soundtrack as well for that. Thank God. Yep. Uh, and then I watched Leave the World Behind. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about challenging, yeah. folks. Oh, my God. Uh Talk about a minefield to get around as far as talking spoilers and everything. So uh, kind of, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. I'm excited. I watched it because we can. I'm excited to talk about it. With oh, you. sure, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Other than that, we have to start things off right away. Uh, right away with a make good from me. I need oh, to give an apology. Oh no, don't. Uh, if you can believe I don't, it, I don't need you to back down. I need you to be my rock. No I, apologies. I, <laughs> w- I was a bad person last week, and I had uh, berated. I berated our one producer. <laughs> Max, because I thought he, I, I was, I had it in my head that a that a movie ticket yeah. was over twelve dollars. It right. was twelve and change. Uh-huh. So when Max donated, he goes, "Hey, you know, twenty four dollars, two tickets. I'm yeah, going, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm shaking, I'm shaking my pockets. You know what I mean? I'm just wanted, <laughs> where's short. the change? You know what I mean? I feel like the Red Cross people or whatever, the Red Bucket people. <laughs> now that it's Christmas, I got the bell. It's like you know, you know, two tickets, not quite. Anyway, it's eleven and change. Yeah. That Max don't it was oh it's eleven and change so he, he hit it so Max not only gave us two movie tickets worth wow but he also gave us a little bit more wow and I berated the poor bastard rounded and, up uh, for the kids yeah. rounded up for the starving children so God knows we're light on producers every week as we get going we're still spinning You're always scared of all <laughs> so anyway apologies to Max we thank you so much for your two tickets and a little bit extra uh, and uh, the cage match is coming soon yeah I suppose <laughs> I guess I gotta take the bullet on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're first up in the ring. Uh, okay, Vince. So, anything other than opening notes for you? 
Uh, no, I mean, this is going to be a long episode. That's my opening notes. (laughs) (laughs) First one uh, is a brief one, uh, because I really don't have a lot to say. Okay. Challenging because of that. (laughs) Well, let's get into it right away, because I was surprised or interested to why you picked these first two ones, obviously. So we're going back to 1984. This is called Paris, Texas by Wim Wenders. Basically did some research on the film stuff, but getting it on the site. But this was the winner for the Palme d'Or or whatever like that oh, wow. uh, for the Cannes Film Festival oh, nice, back nice. in 84. Mm. So it was the film of the year at Cannes. Sure. Other than that, uh, why this film? Why this week? Sure, sure. So um, Wim Wenders uh, is – coming out before the end of the year and you know watch the clock there's not that much time no. he is releasing two new movies uh before the end of the year that will count oh. in 2023 both of these films aren't really getting a lot of critical buzz but Wim Wenders was actually going to be um the subject of or a potential director study that I wanted to do really yeah oh yeah. i don't know any of that okay uh, and i really don't know a lot about him either so you know recently coming across the work of Win Wenders uh, researching these new director studies that I want to do in 2024. You know, he's a German director. He looks interesting. Uh, his films look interesting. <laughs> I wanted to give one of his most notable films a shot before I put a ring on things. And I'm really okay. glad I did because I really didn't love this film. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I'm embarrassed. I don't really know this guy at all. Oh, no. I, honestly, that's no point of embarrassment. Okay. This is definitely in. I don't want to say art house, but for sure this is not meant – You know, he is not even trying to achieve any sort of mainstream success in this. He's okay. trying to tr- achieve very small personal films without the comedy, almost like a, uh, almost like a Woody Allen. Uh, okay. It feels like a day in the life type of stuff. And he's and coming out with two? Two. Coming up? Two. So Jeez. you know, his work spans all the way back to the 60s. First of all, wow. so I mean, you know, he's a working guy, uh, but nonetheless, uh, a lot of these films I don't even remotely recognize. Okay, you know? I mean, okay. I'm, I'm constantly diving into you know different filmographies and whatnot. Nonetheless, you know, he's app- applauded as you know one of these best direct, uh, best German directors uh, in in kind of uh, the modern film landscape. And these two new re- releases are Anselm and Perfect Days, both coming out within 2023. I don't know if these wow. had. Uh, a run, I would assume, just because I, I don't know what audience he has, you know, other than these, you know, these I don't even know about these two films. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, so. then you know, I got my toe in the water a little bit, as I like to say. <laughs> yeah. I like to think I know a little bit what's going on. Oh yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that that's where it was like I needed to I needed to jump into one of his most recognizable. Not that I really even recognize Paris, Texas, but I needed to understand what he was about and if i even wanted to give it the uh yeah the time it's good that we're covering like i said it did win the whatever the essentially the best film award during cans that year sure that usually says something good yeah absolutely absolutely sadly you know this film was difficult to unpack and more often than not i was always on the verge of um yeah, well, it was always on the verge of losing my interest. <laughs> uh, I mean, boring is the wrong word. Uh, I thought uh, just just not engaging. Uh, though I was, you know, thoroughly bored while watching this. Uh, you know, performances and even style to the film are, are so intentionally downplayed that it felt like a fight to grasp at meeting every moment, and then that stretched across a painfully long runtime with this film. I mean, this film, again, I I don't want to – I never want to throw out criticisms like boring or something so subjective like that, but it was was a little bit pulling teeth. I will say the story seems small. I know Mm -hmm. that the cast is small, and it's two hours and 25 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Um, So it's – it's you're a lot with these characters, and Mm. I can only imagine how dialogue-heavy it is. No. (laughs) The opposite. If anything, the emphasis is lack of dialogue. Uh, our main character is mute for, uh, I would say, a good half of the runtime. Uh, so we had, so we had the killer on Netflix, <laughs> yeah. where the guy barely talked, yep. and it was just narration. <laughs> then we had the one yes last week, Silent yep. Night, yep, yep, which with the guy couldn't talk at all, and we're back here. <laughs> and but this one, two hours and twenty five minutes. Yeah, I mean, granted, he does at the end. If anything, he becomes a little bit of a chatterbox, but. Um, yeah, for long stretches of the film, he is kind of um, emotionally scarred, and okay. that that's where this like muteness comes in. But boy, is it 
as desolate as the desert. Uh, <laughs> it is, it is, it is uh, tough. So where, tough to watch. where does this plot take us? Uh, yeah, so so Paris, Texas stars uh, Harry Dean Stanton, uh, who uh, is always kind of an actor. I say, oh yeah, I like him. <laughs> you know, pretty much just from him. St- uh, you know, in Alien, he plays a stranger that wanders out of literally nowhere in the desert, wearing a cheap suit and a red baseball cap. We discover that this nobody has been missing for four years and now has a whole life to rediscover it's less amnesia and more of a traumatic blocking out okay uh, at first i was guns out <laughs> knives out <laughs> teeth showing i said what how is this amnesia another one <laughs> yeah, yeah and then and so critically acclaimed i mean like ebert gave this like a perfect score four, back yeah, in the day four stars yeah so I was like, what is this? No, but it, 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 it plays more into the uh, emotional side uh, of what he is, why he left in those four years and why that is kind of a, a blackout period. Um, most dramatically, Stanton left behind a son who is now estranged uh, and untrusting of this mute weirdo reintroduced into his life. So uh, the implicit drama is him trying to not only – find his way through this uh, foggy reality that Mm -hmm. he now comes back into, but also the the challenge uh, of reconnecting with his own son where that has no problem. He has memories of his son, and and, and that's the emotional uh, through line to the film. Many scenes will quietly focus on Stanton's character. uh, Once again, processing this strange reality he's returning to, there is an unspoken tragedy that he has left a life behind, And that kind of fogs his everyday life moving forward. And a depressive gray tone smears over, uh, I mean, I'm talking every scene of the film. This is a very sad movie. Um, So he's a depressing person to watch. Oh, The boy is depressing to watch. Yeah, it's a depressing context. But, uh, you know, I've said it probably a good dozen times on the podcast. I like sad things. I I, I, I am a weirdo in the sense that if a movie is making me feel miserable, I kind of like it, you know. (laughs) Stylistically... Uh, this is just driven home on every level. On a positive, I feel stylistically, this is really brought home with a lonesome blues soundtrack done by Ry Cooter, uh, which last time I think we touched on Ry Cooter was uh, Streets of Fire, I want to say. I remember, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it but- was one film, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, I mean, yeah, it's he's, he's a cool name, but also he's, oh, he's like I- a blues legend. Yeah, so. I think I know what it was, actually. Yeah. It was that it was that one film, and maybe it was what you just said. And it was the one film I believe the guy, cool character, mm-hmm. uh, main actor. We know the name, and he played a uh, was he a like a biker? Yes, yes, that's Streets that, that, of Fire. Oh, okay, yeah. it is. Yep. Huh? <laughs> absolutely. It's a little bit of a wow, musical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but this this blue this lonesome blue soundtrack. I mean, it, it really is some perfect pairing on. Um, the, the attitude, the mindset that our character's in, and scenery most of all. Paris, Texas, uh, you know, just in the in the name of how it sounds, it sounds, you know, uh, middle of nowhere. Uh, yeah. And uh, that type of uh, emptiness is the outline that our characters feel every day now, and especially Stanton's character in this uh, blackout four-year period that he's now trying to piece together. So props in... Crafting, setting the stage, if you will, mm-hmm. for why this is a story we care about. But oh my God, is this movie pulling teeth to get through? Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I like artsy stuff. I can get behind a a movie living off a pure concept. But while I was occasionally struck with beauty of this uh, kind of contemplative tone this contemplative scenes that come across the film, it was just impossibly slow. And and impossibly slow, especially when considering you got, you know, two hours and 20 plus. Yeah. Yeah, in front of you. Uh, It was was a frustrating experience. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Worst of all, I feel the answers that eventually come out of this when, for instance, Stanton starts talking, and he almost doesn't stop talking then in a very annoying way, uh, makes the story worse. I feel the the story is much better when our mind is, uh, as the audience, is kind of racing and seeing like, wow, what what could have possibly happened? Mm -hmm. As the answers come along, it's... uh, 
maybe a through line to what the film is trying to achieve, but just as disappointing as the lack of engagement when with what you're watching on screen. So real, no real payoff then. Yeah. Either. You're waiting all this time and there's still, it's, it's not giving like, you much. Oh, okay. It's just kind of like, <laughs> oh, he's just a bad person. Okay. <laughs> you know, where so much of this film is empathetic uh, towards this. Right, uh, it's, right. it's, it's, it's a tragedy almost. So, uh, you know, Stanton is, like we said, a, a near mute for half of the film. And when he speaks, so many lines of what he says or actions that he takes um, removes the angle of sympathy towards his sadness. And I think that's where I, I really stuck the most with my final feelings on this film. Not to reduce Wender's ar- artistry here, but this movie is, once again, two hours and 25 minutes, and that runtime dulls the already intentionally dull experience. And intentionally dull experience is what it's trying to achieve. The drama and the story is what suffers because of this. And I wouldn't have a problem with this if that story didn't try to awkwardly grow into something normal when it only slightly worked as a quiet oddity and a uh, an oddity that uh, I, I haven't really seen a film like it. it. certainly deserves praise in that regard, but so much of it just felt like it never got its own footing, and when it got its footing, it kind of destroyed what was working in the first half. Mm. So I'm coming out very cold on this. Ebert shaking in his grave. We're going to go <laughs> ahead and give Paris, Texas, 1984, a 48. Oh, wow. Okay, 48. Yeah. Uh, Won the BAFTA for Best Picture, too. <laughs> yeah, listen, <laughs> listen. Uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't help how I feel about it. And, and, and again, I, I feel like even on a critical level, there are things that – the film almost self sabotages itself. Yeah, uh, very painful to get through. Okay, so well, a Wender study will not be coming down the pipeline. <laughs> I'll, I'll maybe it's, we'll see. You know, it's a busy end of the year, folks. Um, very busy, very busy. Uh, I mean, I think something that we've both prided ourselves on this year, Tom, is uh, how many movies we've covered. Yeah, uh, which is which is awesome to see. And we can't wait to unpack that on, you know, episodes like the Tom Daly's coming up uh, for our award ceremony, folks. We'll see if we can fit in those two other movies. But I, I from the looks of them, they look exactly like Paris, Texas. Okay. So I don't know if that's going to be for me. And they're not being talked about at all. Yeah. I don't think anyone's going to be craving much that we, that we need to get those on the board. And, and weird ones. Like Perfect Days is like a movie – in I, I think it all in Japanese, and it's like and he's a, he's a and German, he's a German guy. I, I, yeah, and so that that's where honestly a lot of the interest comes from. My side is just like this guy's clearly doing what he wants, yeah. which I I respect. But uh, it's got to be pretty old too. It's been working since the sixties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, if Paris, Texas was on your radar, um, <laughs> by, by some <laughs> yeah. by some chance, maybe uh, uh, approach, don't watch it. <laughs> approach it tepidly, I would say, <laughs> or maybe aggressively, just to stay awake on watching. This yes, film. and don't accidentally watch Paris, France. By the way, <laughs> oh, is Paris, that... France, different movie. Apparently, extremely sexual. Oh, I started because okay. I was was putting it on the site. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I started putting in credits, and I was like, wait a second, is this a real film? Because it was just like the most sexual film ever, and I was just like, did Vim watch this? <laughs> I was like, ooh, whoops a daisy, Texas. Uh, Answer yes. is Texas. Um, okay, 848%. Vin, let's keep on things moving here. We're jumping right away to 2018. This is If Beale Street Could Talk, directed mm. by Barry Jenkins, who we know from Moonlight. Yes, yes. And is this pre Moonlight or post? Post. Uh, the Actually, his only feature film after the fact. Oh, really? So, yeah. And soon after, right? Yeah. Like uh, a year or two. Uh, yeah, I think two years after, uh, he, he, he flips right away into it and got some Oscar buzz but um, yeah this is pretty well regarded critics seem to like this film mm. so if Beale Street could talk uh, one how did you like it and once again this week uh, why this week exactly? sure so yeah th- this was a selfish pick that doesn't really tie itself into anything this week but um, I listened to a lot of movie soundtracks probably driven in my algorithm by my my note editing process and this soundtrack in particular from Oscar winning Nicholas Bertel uh, had a hold on me uh being a just such a profoundly beautiful and emotional piece that i needed to see the movie attached to wow it. okay yeah well you know uh, i like i like this guy oh yeah we did the theme song get the, the <laughs> composed for succession yes yeah which, which which amazon has told me was my number one listen in the year 2023 <laughs> <laughs> really really shocked me really, really surprised me that the number one thing i listened to was the succession theme song <laughs> 
<laughs> the check from uh, HBO in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, the pedigree doesn't stop there. Uh, like you said, this is the the movie, fo- the follow-up film from writer-director Barry Jenkins, uh, who <laughs> suffered humiliation at the now infamous 2017 Oscars. Uh, the corrected Best Picture win for 2016's Moonlight was a really good film, yeah. uh, and a film that I enjoyed. Not embarrassing for him. Uh, I guess. Because yeah. the film, he he ended up being the winner. Mm, true, true. You know what I mean? I guess I think it's embarrassing for everyone involved. Yeah. Uh, you know, faux pas. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, while he has mostly done TV projects since, this is his only feature to follow up. Folks, what I did not expect was this much of a heady, heavy hitter. Uh, this was a phenomenal Ooh, movie. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. Okay. If Beale Street Could Talk covers many angles of racial divide and legal inequality that persists in James Baldwin's 1974 novel, using the early part of the decade to show some of the nastiest sides of New York. But in the forefront is a tender romance that survives the dark expectations of this story. These same expectations allow the watching experience of this movie to avoid cliche and without a doubt is one of the best movies I saw all year. Also, that year... I believe was the same year that Judas and the Black Messiah, I think it won the best picture of that year, but also a, a hmm. phenomenal movie. Phenomenal movie. You did like that. It was in the 80s, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, something, something to return to uh, again and again. Uh, I, I will say that uh, this movie, I, I expected it to go one way, and... I think for some folks out there, if you if you give this a watch, you may be disappointed with that it doesn't go where you expect it. Uh, but for that same reason, that's why I felt this film was so great. Like I opened up the episode with, it was a challenging week because it was kind of putting into words what I felt was such a emotional and I don't want to I don't want to sound too flowery with my with my words but almost a spiritual type of experience as well. Hmm. Uh it was just such a powerful powerful movie in its execution. Really want to give hats off to Barry Jenkins for this one. This is much better than Moonlight. Uh, I mean Moonlight uh, you gave a 72. You didn't mm-hmm. hate but you certainly Moonlight was yeah it was we covered it pre-podcast. Sure. You know, it was yeah. couch days, basically. Yeah. You just could not uh, – you were not hyped about it like everyone else was. Sure, or a lot sure. of other critics were. Yeah. Um, you could appreciate it, but that that was really being lifted up, mm, that film. Absolutely. And, and maybe that's uh, driven by uh, I, I, me really enjoying La La Land and especially coming from um, okay, yeah. uh, Damien Chazelle as a director mm-hmm. as well. So uh, I, I might have noted it for certain movies in the past, but this is a great movie for understanding the importance of camera work. Uh, this was a film that I rarely took notes while watching because so much is communicated in its visuals that I really didn't want to take my eyes away. The the classic uh, phrase, every fame, frame a painting, uh, I think is a good description of this film. The cinematography is often intimate. Uh, blocking stays tight on a maximum of two figures for nearly every scene. This visual language is introduced to us in the context of romance. Uh, emphasizing their love, which makes perfect sense, but... As the drama builds and as some crime elements build, the same closeness is used in drastically different ways. These ways include, and again, in the same type of intimate blocking that Mm -hmm. we get – Uh, This closeness of two characters, the fear of admitting a pregnancy, juggling glares with – or rather judging glares with no intentions to hide them, and especially the prejudice barely covered in this setting. Jenkins approaches all of this with the same proximity on on screen and just how we'll say dozen times on the podcast, and I'll probably even say it again for a film later uh, in the episode, it is all in the execution, folks. This film has such a design to it that uh, I really did enjoy the, you know, all the scenes passing by. It kind of just melted away and created mm. just such an immersive experience to know these characters in these little pocket scenes that they're basically in these one on ones, whether that one on one is with a friend, a family, or an opposition. Yeah. So, and like you said, it needs to be done really well. 
because one, the acting needs to be there. Oh, yes. And two, there could be an awkwardness as far as viewer and then what's on the screen mm. to the mm-hmm. screen. It could almost feel too invasive. Yeah. Where you're sitting there wanting the camera to pull back a little bit. Sure. You know sure. what I mean? Sometimes if you've seen extreme close ups mm-hmm. uh, or close ups of two extended period of time, mm-hmm. you have that natural thing of like, you just want to back up a little bit. Sure, sure. So, and also, if you're not engaging with the script or the performances, this oh, would also oh, lose yeah. you. I mean, it's why kind of a shot reverse shot is the primary way we see dialogue because it keeps our interest going mm-hmm, and something yeah. changing on screen. But I felt it was it was really perfectly executed. This, this kind of evolving scene of building blocks from the very start is a quality uh, uh, to the tone of the film and is right there in that soundtrack that brought me to it in the first place. Uh, Bertel's noir sounding horns have little variation track to track, especially if you were to listen to this isolated. But it is the moments it is paired with that transforms how we hear the music. The solo trumpets and saxophones can stand out in moments of triumph, uh, assuring us that romance and love will conquer the day. And the next thing you know, the very same notes communicate the cold indifference the city has for seemingly every soul inside of it. It was such a... Uh, I don't know, well-designed, I guess, for lack of a better Mm -hmm. word. I mean, this is maybe when some of my expertise around music specifically falls short, but I felt it was such a... Incredibly uh, appropriate. Yeah, exactly. Just a, a soundtrack that I can only imagine was created very much alongside the writing process mm-hmm. or the adapting process of the novel of this film. Now, did this feel th- – now, this is – what time frame are we – in 74 i think that's when the novel was released and it seems like it's it's written present day okay so early 70s new york certainly nasty and yucky so did the did the music was the music fitting for just the mood of the film or did the music take you back as well to Mm. the 70s uh maybe not an entirely appropriate for the 70s but i guess i guess my answer to that is that these characters come from such pr- poverty mm, okay. uh, that maybe in, in listening to these jazz stylings of the film, uh, sounding like almost like a 50s noir or something okay. like yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that, that almost plays into a – Kind of a hand me down nature uh, of, uh, of of what they have to listen to, right? Right. Uh, okay. And uh, a lot of that is communicated from needle drops on a literal vinyl inside, uh, or just these atmospheric horns that Bertel is putting over these scenes. You know, whether they're romance or whether they're twisted and dark. Cool. But honestly, uh, the, the, like I said, folks, this is a something that the execution was so amazing on that. While watching this movie and while watching almost every movie this week, I was Mm -hmm. peppered with the thought that I should just let the films speak for themselves. Obviously, my my, my job is is, (laughs) to speak. Yeah, to speak (laughs) and to to explain. But for the qualities that I I loved about, you know, or or was finding uh, appreciation for in in every one of these films this week, even even, even Paris, Texas, as I maybe was (laughs) nodding off a little bit, you know, it's something that. Uh, I felt on the strong notes, it really just needed to be seen. And it, uh, words can't describe what is uh, what is crafted and what is weaved together for this. Uh, and it comes up here in talking about performances with this film. Obviously, it, because of the the cinematography and how scenes are set up, performances are a huge highlight here. Yeah, um, they need to be good. Yeah, uh, this this plays into Regina King receiving an Oscar for her performance as the mother. That honestly comes nowhere close to the incredible job seriously everyone does on screen. I really did love every single performance in it, and 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 that's where I say give this film a watch for yourself to experience the many wonderful parts in sync for every minute of the runtime. We're going to go ahead and give If Beale Street Could Talk an 86. Whoa! whoa! A must watch. Wow! A must watch. Woo, folks! <laughs> wow, baby, you really you slapped me across the face with that one. <laughs> yeah. Wow, eighty six percent. Yeah, this a was, must watch. This was a phenomenal movie. Like uh, I said, I knew it was rated high. Like critics liked it, sure, but it right. wasn't like it wasn't out of control. I wasn't I, expecting this. I feel like this. even when it was coming out, because wow. that's when you know I think both of us were kind of slowly more and more tuning into trying to watch a lot of movies. Uh, Not so much me. <laughs> it's it's 20, 2018. Oscars is twenty nineteen. That's yeah. when we weren't quite. 
quite there yet. The couch days, mm. but we weren't rolling with this podcast sure, yet. That's sure. for sure. Right. Uh, but uh, man, oh yeah. man, uh, on the surface was a movie uh, I, I I thought was not even worth paying attention to. Boy, was I wrong. And uh, and and still even watching today. I mean, this was such a good movie. Wow, I mean, really one of the best of the year that I had the pleasure Folks. of watching. If Beale Street Could Talk, 2018 by Barry Jenkins. Let's just highlight a little bit. Uh, so also, Kiki Lane is yep. the main actress. Stephen James mm-hmm. um, is the lead actor. Like you said, Regina King got the Oscar nom uh, Yeah, for what playing. surprised me is that that love wasn't spread around for nominations. Um, and I guess it's, it's, it, you know, it's kind of no dub point of about Oscar snubs year to year, but well, um, yeah. you know this this one surprised me because so much of wow. it is a platform, you know, for these characters and for these actors playing the roles. Unbelievable. Okay, all right. So eighty six percent. That's huge. And another note on Barry Jenkins because okay, he's done basically two films mm. and uh, very high regarded. Oh, he absolutely. Won the Oscar on the one, but I think it's very very cool because he's still pretty young. I think. Mm-hmm. You know, just props to writer and director, mm. you know, because it seems like the writing was phenomenal in this absolutely, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'll it, be very excited to see what, what his next project is, whether it's a like a book adaptation like this or I believe something original like Moonlight. I think Moonlight was original. I'm not too wow. sure. I was not expecting a, uh, a must-watch here on this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 86 is a huge score, folks. Like, right. Just say if you're new to the podcast, 86 is huge. Oh, If you're absolutely. above 85, we say that that is like – all time must basically watch. must watch for any audience member. Make some time to watch it. Wow. Absolutely. Okay. All right. All right. Eighty six for for if Beale Street could talk, folks. Do not sleep on that. Even this in, in this in what is an unbelievably busy December as far as new movies are <laughs> yeah, concerned. Yeah. Maybe carve out some time or just make a note in your own list. Uh, watch this at some point. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I definitely will here coming up. Yeah, and it's, it also speaks to maybe a challenge. Um, I think we were talking about this uh, off off podcast, but it's uh, it's kind of tough sometimes when you know a movie is good. It kind of gets pushed to the back burner because you say like oh i you know i know it's good uh i'll call it godfather syndrome you know everyone knows the godfather is good no one actually watches the godfather (laughs) uh so uh but i I really hope this movie does not fall to the uh, your your back burner list folks Uh, it was such a a well-crafted movie and and again if you if you listen to some of our reviews and when we get to cinematography you're like i don't know i just don't appreciate films this way once again this is and and like i've noted on a few others this is a phenomenal starting point to try to grasp an appreciation for why cinematography matters and why blocking matters and things like that. All right, so kind of just a very good, I don't know, we can all learn something from this film a little bit. Uh, Sure. People who listen who are not just the casual kind of viewer, people who are into film who listen Mm because we know that there's some out there. Um, If you're interested in film craft. Definitely don't sleep on this film. Excellent, Vin. Very, very good. Okay, so before we jump into our newly released films, we just want to remind people that we are completely uh, producer-supported. So basically... There are no subscriptions here. There are no paywalls here. Uh, there are no payment tier structures here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's all value for value. It's a value for value model. So basically what that means is are you enjoying listening to the podcast every week or are you stopping by every so often when there's a film that you care about mm. but you care to hear Vin's review of it? Maybe even a Tommy Two Shoes if you're lucky. <laughs> uh, are you enjoying it every week? Are you curtailing or into film more now than what you were before you were listening. Also, are you using the website? You know, before turning something on Netflix, you're gonna be like, well, let's just, you know, mm. let's just check the daily ratings real quick. Let's see if it's on there, and uh, kind of judging from that. Or are you just having a good time? Basically, mm-hmm. that's all value in your pocket. We ask you to give us value back in our pocket. It's a value for value model. Um, and basically, what you do is you go to the donations tab on the dailyratings.com, and you can donate whatever amount, whether it's one of our fun set donations or whether it's whatever donation you want. You set the amount. It's your value that you're getting that you can send our way. When you do that, you can write in a note, whether it's on PayPal, uh, the PayPal note side, or you can just email at tom.vin at the daily ratings.com. Email a note, whether it's questions, comments, critiques, you want to know something else un- you know, move, not movie related, or you want to dive deeper on something, or you want to give a critique to the show, you want to see something different. Uh, like I said, it's producer supported. When you donate, you are a producer. We're going to read those notes. We're going to take it seriously, and we'll read them right here on the podcast. This is the producer segment here. So uh, that's kind of how we operate. We're enjoying it. Uh, we thank you to uh, producer last week. Sorry for sorry for getting the numbers <laughs> wrong, but. Um, 
you know, we're we're 112. This is 112 episodes here. Yeah. And we're still growing. We started basically with a with an audience of zero because we didn't come. We weren't known to the outside world mm. or anything. It's not like Vin's been a uh, movie critic for 30 years and now we started a podcast. You <laughs> right, know? Right. So it's great to see that our numbers kind of grow week after week or, you know what I mean, even at this point, year after year. Mm-hmm. It's excellent to see uh, something that's so huge for us, though, is to get the word out about the show. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so huge. If you can just tell a friend or you hear somebody bitch about Rotten Tomatoes. You hear some guy behind you just can't stand Rotten Tomatoes as we all can't stand it. Hey, get us in the conversation. Like I like to say, that's where we want to be. We want to be in the conversation. So all of you who are enjoying the podcast and uh, really can get something from it, if you could, just just get the word out a little bit. We appreciate that so much. Like I said, if you want to become a producer, it's the dailyratings.com, any amount you want. It's a value for value model. Okay, Vin, with that, let's keep it going here. We're going to start with our Netflix release. Oh, this, is our, this is our newly released film. The Minefield. Let's get into it. It's Leave the World Behind, yeah. by, directed by Sam Esmel, mm-hmm. and uh, executive produced by the Obamas. No way. Yeah. Oh, you didn't hear about the- Wait, what? Oh, oh Michelle and Barack are all over this. <laughs> what Ma- are you talking Malia's about? Malia's an associate. What? No, that's a joke. But, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the Obamas, uh, the Obamas executive produced this. Oh, wow. He's getting some heat now, which I think is really <laughs> stupid mm. um, for the content for a movie that he's executing for a movie that he's producing, and then kind of the overall tones or mm. what's going down in the film. Um, I think that's stupid. I think there's other reasons, maybe to uh, sure, you know, of any producing of this, of just in, as far as how is the movie. Yeah, yeah, true. But true. I'm tripping over my words a little bit. Let's get into it. Well, leave- this movie's tripping over itself. For <laughs> sure. leave, leave the world behind, man. Uh, how did you like it? Let's set it up a little bit. Well, oh boy, I was really looking forward to this for one. Especially because why? Um, uh, Smell coming from Mr. Robot. You know, this is his first feature. I've never really dived into Mr. Robot, but I definitely respect the writing and and the tone it takes. I enjoy. I enjoyed. Uh, I yeah, watched, I watched season one yeah, sure, as I do. Right, uh, right. But loved it. your your brilliant hot take <laughs> of only watching season one of good shows, which is prophetic. <laughs> you you have a third eye. I would say only this. I forgot about this until you said it. Oh the yeah, Mr. Yeah, Robot thing, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Robot, and uh, Stranger <laughs> Things. That's yeah, all. Yeah, right. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> and I and unfortunately, I think Mr. Robot does actually degrade a little bit. Uh, uh, that's what I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, uh, Matt D, uh, our producer, is a huge fan of the show, so he's he, my knowledge. Is mostly coming secondhand from okay. him. So. <laughs> uh, I was excited. I'll say this: I'll, I was excited for the film. Okay, uh, just for the fact of it's Ethan Hawke. Mm. So we were we were on the Hawk train. The Hawk we were, train. You know, we were on the Hawk. I have to Hawk, think of something for that. Uh, <laughs> we're on the Hawk flight. The Hawk Harrier. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless, we're still we I, we can talk more about him. I think he might he's arrived potentially. What do you? <laughs> What do you mean arrive? Well, Ethan Hawke has always been just like looked down upon. Oh. He had like one big film or one film that people like him in the early 90s. <laughs> and then he's always just people shit on him for being a bad actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I contest that or contend that he is a very – not a very good actor, but I want him to be good. Sure, yeah, I think yeah, he's yeah. got a look, a style. He's, he's from a, Texas. He's... There's something about him that I like. <laughs> the definition of our boy. You know, we have many boys. Yes. But, but you know, this Hawks is a bad boy. reason. Most of our boys are because they're great at acting <laughs> right. and we enjoy their roles. This one, he's like uh, he's like our make-a-wish Ethan boy. <laughs> <laughs> We're really rooting for him. But uh, uh, so anyway, so Ethan Hawke, yeah, yeah. Ethan Hawke was in it, but also Ethan Hawke with Kevin Bacon. Was <laughs> yeah, in it. yeah, I played into the meme uh, that uh, even even on a podcast episode, I, I made the mistake of you know, interchanging those two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a big meme going on. Oftentimes, people get those guys confused, and yeah. it's a big deal to have them on screen. Um, but uh, but this is our second last release uh, from Netflix for the year. Our very last being Zack Snyder's new space epic Rebel Moon, uh, set for later this month. Um, this film looking a lot. Uh, uh, a lot more thought provoking, <laughs> and uh, this largely is because it comes from Sam, Sam Esmail. Beyond his work with Mr. Robot, my expectations for this movie was to it was that it was going to be at least cerebral. Uh, I didn't know my expectations for how technology was going to be uh, introduced into its uh, kind of social question. Mm-hmm. At first, starting as a a thriller that 
is probably some of the best things that can be about a thriller, that it adds to a thought-provoking or conversation-provoking after the fact, mm-hmm. uh, or even while you're watching this movie, of which side of questions you land on. Uh, so I think it did a very good job at that, uh, and performance as well were good, but I have to be honest, folks, I don't have a lot of interest in talking about this film without spoilers. Uh, it's a serious minefield uh, to get around. I feel like this movie, if my elevator pitch is anything, I feel like this movie is M. Night Shyamalan's wet dream. Uh, hmm. The the many twists, the events outside of our character's control, and most importantly, the interpersonal drama, in many ways, this is what uh, Knock at the Cabin wishes it could be. An examination of our bias, an examination of misinformation, poised through a suspicious thriller drama. And that really is uh, what Leave the World Behind is. Uh, Leave the World Behind is spotlighting two groups of characters to throw them into an uncomfortable social scenario where tensions are slowly tightened over the runtime. Our first being a four-square family unit, seemingly to be satirical in some way, I want to say. Did you get that as well? I was kind of poking fun uh, of uh, of this side of the family. Uh, yes, I think maybe uh, maybe a little bit. Yeah, like as far as like the directing, the, the director trying to go somewhere. Oh uh, yeah, like purposely. Yeah, purposely kind of putting them into uh, stereotypical kind of roles. Uh, I guess what I mean by that is, you know, yeah. this 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 family consists of a a kind of a Karen suspicious mom played by Julia Roberts, a very easygoing kind of stoner academic father played by Ethan Hawke, and two kids fitting into both a Zoomer and and kind of Gen Alpha uh, yeah. demographic. I, to I it. think, yeah, basically, I think to make the movie work, um, here are stereotypical roles, mm. and then sometimes the director tries to crank those up to eleven, mm. uh, specifically with Julia Roberts' character. Yes, yeah, yeah, Big time. I would say Julia Roberts' character. And um, Mahershal, uh, his daughter. Oh yes, who plays Ruth? Her name is uh, Mahala. Okay, okay. I would say those two characters are kind of like okay. Let's pick stereotype here. Mm. Let's crank it up when we need to. Mm, for the film, sure, which sure. I don't know if it hits exactly, but kind of represents the two sides of, of Twitter or something like that. So. Uh, yeah, I just think it's trying to like add more to the film. Mm. I, mean, I mean, Julia Roberts is an outrageous. <laughs> yeah. Julia Roberts is out of control in this film, and to the point where it's not believable. Because like, okay, we know yeah, what you're going for, right? This is this is Julia Roberts. <laughs> a couple notches too much. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree. That would be my thing as far as poking fun at the characters or mm. poking fun at these stereotypes. Mm-hmm. I think it's. He wanted these stereotypes, and then sometimes they're cranked up when he wants them to. Sure, right. Uh, that that definitely uh, hits on hits the nail on the head as far as my feelings of the film. That it um, picks and chooses its story logic, which we'll get into in a little bit. This uh, family rents an upscale Airbnb uh, in the middle of the night. The owners of the house mysteriously arrive asking to stay the night. Uh, this is the second side of the coin, coin which intentionally plays into suspicions. Uh, the abrupt arrival of a of the wealthy father, played by Mahershala Ali, raises questions immediately. And his outspoken dogger juggles shades of being justified and arrogant in their request. Uh, the reason why they are all there is a mysterious blackout seemingly affecting the East Coast, raising even and more questions uh, at the worst possible time of this uh, interpersonal debate. There are a few areas that I take issue with this in this film, but like I said, it's it's very much a minefield for spoilers, so I will do my best to kind of illustrate my position here because if there's any reason to watch it, it is just for the twists and turns mm-hmm. of where it goes and you know how much it, the film wants to be like a mic drop. Oh, can you believe this? Yeah, can it, you believe it what is happened? Heavi- <laughs> it is <laughs> I, I, it's, I wouldn't even say it's mo- it's a lot of thriller. It is heavy, heavy mystery mm. or weird, creepy mystery. So the mm-hmm. problem with talking about it is, you know, it's for the pe- it's for the viewers mm. to have that mystery unfold. Yes. So we really have to take yeah. much a ten thousand foot view of this one. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was originally going to uh, speak about how it's tough because I, I don't always like like whodunits and, and mysteries like that. But I think a good mystery is 
uh, the mark of a good mystery is that you can't summarize it in one sentence. Mm. Uh, but I don't know. I'll, I'll leave that on on the shelf for now. Okay. Uh, as far as a, a talking point, the mystery does he- here have to jump through hoops to set up its perfect scenario. That once again, the audience can kind of sit back and choose what side of the question they land on. Early examples of this being uh, something like, uh, "Do you let these people into the house?" Uh, and what are the chances that this is a scam of some sort? Uh, this is also a lot of the dialogue of the of the Karen, you know, uh, portrayal of uh, Julia Roberts' character. Uh, this sets the framework for how the mystery will progress and test these stereotypical roles uh, the characters fall into. And like I mentioned, the main theme to the entire film being a test of bias and misinformation. Uh, what frustrated me was how the logic of the film just pick picked and choose what what exact amount of reality it wants us to consider in order to set the stage power and communication devices will work inconsistently choosing when to play a role in the story either as a red herring misdirect or uh, actually be a breadcrumb for us to pay attention to uh, and I, I just found this uh, really disappointing when mm. technology felt like it played such a huge role in the director's previous work. Um, I think Esmail for sure has something he wants to say with this film, uh, but the tech felt like more like a screenwriting tool rather than a place in the story's world. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do, do you feel that? Yes. It, it, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Couldn't sum it up any better, I think, than that. You Used as a tool – leading you down a path of thinking that you got to care about it more potentially mm. or something like that. Absolutely. Uh, it doesn't play as much as a role as like a black mirror. Mm. I would say it's what separates itself from a long black. This is not a long black mirror episode, <laughs> sure, sure. but close to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the tech is used just to kind of when he needs it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, you know, that's a great point. Black mirror is probably even a better or, or, or a side by side comparison to the, the M night Shyamalan bit. I guess I feel like, it was. It felt like such a, honestly, maybe even a better version of you know what M Night is pumping out <laughs> right, yeah. in his career. It just felt like so directly about let's make a kind of a question provoking thriller, and then something you know wild is happening behind the scenes that it gives us our kind of our mic drop twist and say, oh, you believe this? This is shocking, right? And then, right. You know, leaves you jaw drop. As far as, as yeah, as far as the. I mean, I was underwhelmed and disappointed almost at every single new turn. Mm. Uh, it just the payoff, much just like what we talked about with Paris, Texas. Uh, when the payoffs came, the payoffs were too weak, mm. in my opinion, for mm-hmm. for most of them. If mm-hmm. he wants to use tech just here, there, and just sprinkle that in, I'm fine with that. Yeah. He sprinkles almost every aspect you can kind of touch. He sprinkles in, mm-hmm. uh, whether it be with animals or other things. And I would be okay with that uh, if you just gave us a little bit more, if it punched more at mm. every turn that we take. Mm-hmm. Um, if things could be uh, – yeah, it, it's all a little bit surface level. Yeah. And that's what I mean about the stereotypes too. It, they're very stereotypical characters. Mm. And just when he decides to be like, okay, well, let's just have this stereotype do this, this stereotype sure, do this. Sure. It's just like, okay, nothing's grand here mm. whatsoever. I don't know. I, I, well, maybe not not grand because I think the movie tries to be grand in in a lot of ways. It's more so these stereotypes kind of make you expect it is going to be a lot more simple. It doesn't have depth to it. I would say for sure. Yeah, for sure. I didn't hate this film. Mm. It was just underwhelming. And then by the conclusion, when it ends, I thought it was was unsatisfying for sure. <laughs> right. And I and I think back to the whole film, and it's just like okay, yeah, at every single turn or new twist. Mm-hmm. Everything could have been ramped up to make this a more engaging thriller mm, mystery. Sure, not sure. so much just like a drama mystery a little bit. Yeah, with also some mystery thrilling boxes. aspect. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just questions that kind of go nowhere. Uh, felt like uh, the type of questions you get lost. You know what I mean? Like the TV show Lost. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Lost did a better job. I mean, this. Yeah. I don't know. I, like you're not hot on this film at all. No, no, no. I'm it's, really not. It's, it's really tough for me to. Yeah, the line for me is that I, I really enjoyed the production of this film. I think this is a well-made film. I think performances are good. I just mm-hmm. really didn't love the story, didn't love the mystery, didn't love the questions that were posed. And again, it's just like – it feels like it rides on the coattails of trying to have like a really like 
crazy like twist conclusion right that i, I don't know I, I don't think any films you know i'm i'm, I'm uh, we go back to our uh knock in the cabin episode i'm not really a fan of like uh, the m night twist if you will mm-hmm. yeah uh, or even 90s movies twists that, that where it's like uh, you know it's obsessed with only the twist did you so. feel big twist of this film uh a little bit. I didn't feel – I wasn't quite waiting for a big twist. Oh, really? I okay. was kind of just waiting for things to unfold in and a cool way. And finally get some answers. Right. Get some mm. answers or, or, okay, let's just see the story continue. Mm, sure, And sure. that's why when the story ends, it's just like, okay, all right. I mean, I get why it ends or where it ends. Mm-hmm. I wasn't crazy sh- – I was never shocked – with the turn of the story too much. Mm, okay, interesting. So for me, I wasn't waiting for a true shock value mm. or a true, you know, waiting for that twist. Yeah, yeah. It was more so like, make it cooler. Mm. Make it make it actually, <laughs> it was trying to make us care too much and I couldn't care about it too much. Oh, really? Okay, and that's what I get. It just wasn't that grand yeah. at all at any part. And I think some aspects were cool. Mm. I like the idea of things, mm-hmm. but the way they played out were uh, not worth it. Or, yeah. Just more boring than what I was hoping they would. Yeah, they yeah, would be. absolutely. Did you think this was over stylized and trying too hard? Uh, no, I, I, like I said, I I think I enjoy the production the most about this. You did, okay. yeah. I think right. this is, uh, if anything, this just shows how much of a prestige looking director that uh, that uh, S- it was can, slick. Can, can it was slick about. looking. Yeah. And, and folks, again, it, it maybe apologies for this being so approximate, you know, so general, but uh, it really is a tough film to talk about without spoilers. Um, just, to, just to return a little bit to some of how my, my gripes with the mystery, it feels like the mystery requires only the exact amount of tech to make sense. And for me, it, it just kind of stripped the logic out of the film, stripped the logic out of the story. And hmm. like, I, like we've said multiple times now, nevertheless, the film wants you to walk away jaw dropped from its spectacle uh, the mic drop revelation but personally it lost my respect a good half hour before it rolls the credits Mm, Um, despite my gripes with the story I think performances are excellent across the board I think every single actor gives a a pretty good performance and even the moments that I was annoyed with characters a perfect example is you know Julie Julia Roberts routine here uh, I wouldn't consider it bad acting I would still consider it good acting what do do you think on that yeah oh no, no, no. She, I, yeah, fine. Yeah, she, she was fine. I would just feel like it was just too unbelievable. Mm. So I'm taking the character in this situation. Mm-hmm. If I'm thinking that you this think is too cartoonish. If I'm thinking this is real life, mm. yes, this is too cartoonish. Oh, okay. So she was fine at being, I think, what they wanted her to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's just too out of control a little <laughs> bit. Like right yeah. off the beat, it was pushing us towards this is this is a mystery thriller mm. you know what i mean i mean from the get-go when uh mahershala mahershala ali yeah. yes when he and his daughter shows up it's from the get-go treat it like a normal movie first mm, yeah yeah, and yeah it really felt like it was pushing us into no 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 this is a big mystery something's, this is a big yeah, thriller. Something's, something's wrong happening. you know <laughs> yeah 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 you know a little spoon fed right and, and especially when those early moments forced. are kind of irrelevant for ultimately yeah the story yeah it's, just, it's too forced <laughs> yeah and yeah. i feel like her character's a little too forced acting was was yeah. good all around for yeah. sure. I, I would say Mahershala Ali is the highlight here standing above the rest of the cast. C- just continuing to prove himself as one of the coolest actors he's so working cool. right now. Yeah. He is. He's so cool. Uh, um, I think we've both been fans since, uh, you know, early seasons of House of Cards with Mahershala. Yeah. And uh, here's hoping we get a somewhat acceptable Blade movie out of him in the future, even though it's probably the fourth time they've stopped and restarted that film. <laughs> so here's hoping for Blade. Uh, folks, uh, I... I I have to be straight up and say I didn't really enjoy this movie. I think its twist can be, once again, thought-provoking, conversation-provoking, uh, especially watch it with a group uh, if you're interested. I think that that's where this movie kind of lives and dies. But uh, the mystery felt less like a puzzle and more like a prescribed conclusion, regardless mm. of what happened in the runtime. However, it is a film I need to recognize as somewhat decent because uh, I think for some audiences, this might be... This might hit for certain audiences as one of the best of the year. The, the audiences that love You twist. think so? Yeah, the audiences that want, like, whoa, the, the, the mind blow uh, <sighs> of a movie. I think for sci-fi fans, this hits uh, for, around its kind of, like, dark predictions of future human nature. 
that have like this non-zero chance of coming true. Uh, and it could really hit, especially if you love near future stories. And mm-hmm. I think that's where Esmail's um, approach to technology is, 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 is somewhat interesting. And you know, he, he's an interesting writer in that space. And I 100%, like I've said now multiple times, if you enjoy M. Night Shyamalan or maybe even Jordan Peele, uh, as far as their work yeah. and, and yeah. how of much of a mind trip it can be, that specific quality, I think this is a, potentially a good watch for you as well. I just wish I was able to turn off my analytic brain a little bit more to just enjoy the ride with this film because I feel like <laughs> I was – this was another one where it's just like, man – I was watching this unfold, and I was like, oh, I'm going to have to work. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? This is, this is like, I have to now tread carefully to avoid spoilers. How do I position? You know, the, you know. so I just wish I was able to just kind of enjoy the ride a little bit more <laughs> on this and enjoy that spectacle. So we're going to go ahead and give Leave the World Behind a 62. Okay, 62. You think that's appropriate? Oh, absolutely. For the production elements and everything? Yeah, I mean, the production were cool. I will say, I kind of felt like maybe he was trying too hard, always trying with the cool shots and things like that. Mm, Sure, sure. What I really like, well, it's a crisp and clean-looking film. Yeah, very slick. What I really like is his, um, what he did with colors. Mm. So blue is a very large film. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, blue is a very large theme. Mm -hmm. And the way he throws blues in there, for sure, reds in certain scenarios where Mm. red's thrown in. Mm -hmm. I like what he does with colors a lot. I thought that was, there was a um, intelligence to to that that I really liked. Yeah, Designed to it, uh, purposeful. Yes, I would say you know I, I don't think we differ too much. I mean, I'm glad I could I could just circle around the drain on this one just with you <laughs> as far as gen- general. Speaking yeah, I'm of really glad we're on the same page with this one. But I would say our differences really are what was the disappointment? So mm, okay. in the tech thing, it really wasn't even a thought of mine saying that this was disappoint. Oh, was okay. disappointing. Uh, I was more so upset with again it leading to things or it trying to be bigger than it actually was. Mm. And every time that turn came or that twist came, I was expecting more because mm. I felt like it was trying to be bigger, badder, more intense, more thrilling, more of a mystery. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so f- finally when we got to things, it was just like, okay, that's the logical next step in this film mm. a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, you know, it's two hours and 18 minutes. I thought it didn't feel overly long. Yeah. Surprisingly, it didn't feel overly long. Yeah, that's true. I, I just wish in that runtime there could have been more just yeah. give me more true um and that's pretty much it i'm not gonna give it to tommy two shoes i don't wow. feel too much i, I i'm sorry i You're... we can't be filling up the site with tommy <laughs> Tush. otherwise we're gonna have to change the whole name of the podcast it's getting it just doesn't work our own technicalities around Tommy Two Shoes. I just didn't we care. We can enough. do whatever we goddamn want. <laughs> <laughs> that's the point of no sponsors. Um, I like your sixty-two percent. I will say that. Okay, yeah, that, that's that's what I'm looking for as far as uh, where you position yourself with the what would be a Tommy Two Shoes, right? You know, you know, from the director. It's funny, just the tech stuff just wasn't on my mind too much. Even coming Wait. from a Mr. Robot, which again, I love that first season, Mr. Robot. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I, I guess it was just like in in the early questions of trying to verify identity and whatnot mm, like that mm-hmm. i just feel like for me i'm not gonna you know I, I can't break it down but it felt like tech was super inconsistent on what was working when when it like when the writing needed it to play a role yeah and then when it would logically play a role but then was not working anymore you know mm-hmm, what i mean mm-hmm. and it was just like i don't know this, this feels like it, it's it's a it's definitely a ride uh, but not a ride that is um, is avoiding a single track. It, that's where I say, like, the conclusion feels prescribed. It's going to happen regardless of all this, you know, sure. talking through the film. So. Which is why I think, if, like you said, um, for the, who this might be an audience for, because mm. 62% that kind of just says, it does say that. It's yeah. probably for some people. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're into the things like you talked about as well. Also, if you just want a, a slick crisp um good looking new film mm, yep. had on the background or just an easy watch or something like that absolutely you know, put down the murder- prestige cast you know exactly yep. it, it's something at least yeah okay. kevin bacon and ethan hawk in one spot they make a joke about it in the film as well uh, julia roberts do. julia roberts mistakes kevin bacon for her husband she doesn't but you told me that before i watched it <laughs> she doesn't she just looks at kevin bacon no she's like oh i thought you were you know she doesn't say that she, she doesn't no oh okay All, she literally just looks at him oh that's it it does a double take i must have been like freaking out you when told it was me happening. she was like oh she even says it she's even <laughs> just like are you my husband i'm waiting for this line and i never get another the line of, the line was was headcanon on my end uh <laughs> ethan hawk was good i'll make one more cut i think he's arrived <laughs> and i'll this. say it, i'll I say love it again this, that this is the hot take ethan hawk has arrived <laughs> he's like what is he 60 like 
<laughs> I know. He's in his 50s, I'm pretty sure. But you know what I mean? I'm always rooting for the guy. Uh, sure. Listen, if and we... Then, I mean, he's in the... In, the, in 2024, if we really want to give Ethan Hawke a, a, a shot, he has that trilogy or four movies uh, that it's just like straight romance. It's like before sunset, after sunset... Has yeah, he already yeah. done some of them, or is he starting? Oh this? no, it's done. It's uh, and it's it's uh, it's the tale of a, of a romance over like three movies. It's like a trilogy romance. And are they gonna pump out like boom, boom, like? Uh, I, I, they already came out. I don't know too much about it. Oh, but two already came out. One. The no, last... it's all out. It, they were like early two thousands. Oh, that they came so we out. don't know. Well. Yeah, but no. Apparently, that's where like that. Those are his moments. Uh, in, okay. uh, in movies. So maybe we can we can we can do a well, little. Well, we thing. know it wasn't the devil may cry. <laughs> which was very unfortunate for that director and everybody else involved. Oh wait, in that no, film. no, uh, before the devil knows you're dead. I oh think. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That a film. worse, uh, infinitely yeah. worse title. <laughs> <laughs> he was in. Um, he was the best. You know that terrible, terrible Magnificent Seven remake. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. With uh, what's his face? I walked out of that movie. One of the few movies really? I walked out of. Yeah. Who was the maker? Denzel. Denzel. Well, the and- director was also the freaking um, who does the Equalizer director. Yes, yes, that's right. Denzel, that's right. Chris Pratt. Yeah. The best part of that film, Ethan Hawke. <laughs> it's like the one only good thing in that film the is saving Ethan Hawke. grace. Regardless, the, anyway, of we're the on Magnificent the, Seven remake. No one was asking. Ethan, for. we're pulling for you. You know. Anyway, <laughs> let's keep. He's things- arrived, <laughs> folks. He's arrived. Put it on t-shirts. I just think he's proven himself. <laughs> 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 All right, let's let's move on here. That's sixty-two uh, percent for "Leave the World Behind." Uh, we hope that was helpful. That <laughs> yeah, review. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, uh, write in if that was legible at all. <laughs> if, if that actually helped you decide I wish I if you wanted to watch. I, re- <laughs> yeah. I really just it didn't make. I didn't help anything. Uh, it's just another one. I sat down to write. I was just like, "Son of a bitch!" I don't. <laughs> I will say, I'm happy I watched it. Yeah. Okay. You know, I am happy I, I saw it. Sure. So I don't know, and it is getting some buzz. The the, the Obama thing is part of the buzz. Well, that's so weird. I I can't believe I did not catch this. And I can uh, talk. We'll talk more off air. Sure. But basically, the reason why he's getting shit, kind of because of like the I get sense, but it's pitches people looking for an ex- oh I looking can, for an excuse. Sure, sure. They're looking for mud to throw online. You know. Yes. So. I would say just for other reasons. It was just like, you know, this, when, this when is your actual- big film. This is your wow. They're finally. I mean, it's always been talked. They've got all kinds of deals going, and this is finally one of the first big productions that mm. they're attached to. Also, probably fiction productions yeah. as well, other, other than like documentaries and something. I like. wonder if they were in charge of the music choices too. I had some music choice oh, really? issues. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, mean, I guess about it that was... scene where Julia Roberts is oh, dancing. Oh yeah. Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. Good time. I think I said out loud. I said, "Oh brother." <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, man. folks. All right, so let's keep it going here. Uh, this is uh, like a, these are all new release here. This is an in theater watch. This is called Eileen, uh, directed by William Oldroyd. This is, I think, big performance backed film. Yes, uh, yes. I was a little bit in the dark on this film too. I wasn't even really sure about it until you uh, brought it up, and I was like, "What? What is this? Another yeah. new film? There's just so much going on." Mm-hmm. So why don't you get into it and tell us what is Eileen? Mm-hmm. Who is Eileen? And uh, how'd you like it? Sure, sure. Well, I, I really did love this movie. Uh, and, and right there with you, Tom, I was not on my radar until recently and, and just kind of trying to tackle everything coming out in December. Um, I have no experience with our director or writers. I can't really call William Oldroy uh, a, a new director, but he has limited work that you would, you know, folks at home, you would stumble across him, myself included. This film is based off the award-winning 2015 novel by the same name, and by a writer I do not have the balls to try to pronounce. Tom, would you like to give this a shot? Moshfeg? That one? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it sounds like a, a Ote- bad word. <laughs> Ote- Otessa, Otessa Moshfeg. Yeah. It is a, a, a tough name, but uh, I really did, uh, you know, jokes aside, I, I was really happy to cover this film. Uh, this was surprisingly good, feeling like a great throwback to Hitchcock-era thrillers. The type of thriller, an older-fashioned type of thriller, where the movie is about pulling you in and almost to the point that you get pulled in until it's kind of too late. It's uh, It feels messy to then see where characters go. And it's like, well, I mean, writing was on the wall, but uh, was was really a great movie. I, I enjoyed okay. this movie a lot. I will say I'm glad that we're pairing this back-to-back from Leave the World Behind. They're both billed as mystery thrillers. Mm, okay. Uh, so Could right, not be yeah, further, <laughs> further apart. Right off the bat, it's seeming like, you know, that's good that this is actually uh, – 
uh, grasping you in a way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Eileen is titled after our main character, uh, played by Thomasin McKenzie. Uh, first time seeing her on the podcast since the slick horror Last Night in Soho from uh, our boy Edgar Wright. Boy, oh boy, is this much, much darker as a film as well. Uh, Eileen lacks the traditional charm expected of her. She works in a prison. She has a washed-up alcoholic father and uh, trouble navigating any romance um, with a little bit of a dirty mind that kind of, you know, shoots her out of the gate. Uh, To quote the film, a a take-a-penny-leave-a-penny girl, a harsh line no less said by her boisterous father as he reflects on his spotty police days. Worst of all, Eileen exists in a type of depressive fog that makes her quickly and dangerously latch on to Anne Hathaway's character, the new psychologist at the prison. Uh, I think one of my favorite qualities is that this film juggles Hathaway as being almost an emotional and intellectual predator. Eileen is, is 24 in this, so it's not like a, like a pedophilia or anything like that, but she is such a Oh, she has such worldly confidence being transplanted into this like dead end Massachusetts town mm-hmm. that when it comes to her role, she just she just owns every scene. And not only are we drawn into that, Eileen as well is is dangerously and quickly and passionately drawn into that personality. Uh, the town is kind of the focus, though. It lives in a fog, just like Eileen. And uh, while this will bring out many poor qualities in the characters that we see on screen, it will bring out a sinister turn when she stalks her prey, Eileen herself. If it is not apparent yet, I would definitely describe this film as a noir, but maybe not for the usual features you might expect. On the surface, the film is extremely dark in its depiction of characters, has this uh, late 50s, early 60s vibe, jazz soundtrack, uh, and if anything, (laughs) might be a a counter pairing with If Beale Street Could Talk. Uh, Not as good, but still, you know, still in that noir feel, uh, untraditional noir. Uh, When it comes down to it, what's deeper there is just how it's named after our main character, Mm -hmm. just how this feels, not Oscar Beatty, but a single platform for Mackenzie's performance. Yeah. Seems like Anne Hathaway as well. Uh, Yes. I wish she was just in it more. Oh, she's, okay, she's, right. She's uh, kind of, dis- you know, I, I loved her in this, mm-hmm. just disappointingly not in it enough uh, because the focus is really a- a- around Aileen. Uh, when when it comes to it, uh, these, these noir themes, it's about testing the character's ethics in some way, just how when you watch an old detective story like that, it's kind of testing how far is this hard-boiled guy mm-hmm. going to go mm-hmm. in just the same way. We're testing the ethics of this middle of nowhere kind of nothing nobody uh, and seeing what they do under pressure. Uh, That setting intentionally spits at uh, the white picket fence of early 60s suburbia uh, being very nasty and hard-boiled. And while it may seem like everyone is content with being that uh, nothing nobody, the story tries to show us that everyone is just looking for an opportunity to lash out. This is not very an optimistic view. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, this is uh, a, a, dark, uh, a dark expectation of what uh, people are capable of. Like I said, I, I like uh, you know evil things. <laughs> I like movies that make me feel bad. And, and, and this movie was just... The oozing style in that regard and follow through. So this is very much, like you said, this is film is focused on this one performance, this character yes. of Eileen. Mm-hmm. What do we see her doing? Like it, it's, you said it's also very town oriented. She's mm. in the prison, things like that. What are we watching her do? Or what are we along the ride with her? Just every, her day to day, a day in the life um, of Eileen? Maybe or? not a day in the life because it is focused. I, I think it's good writing in the sense that this is the most important moment in uh, uh, Eileen's life. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, it's not just uh, kind of language wishing or anything like that mm-hmm. it has a purpose we are uh, we're driving towards something exactly okay early in the film it's focused more about kind of setting the stage of what creates her mentality mm-hmm. her alcoholic father being very emotionally and verbally abusive uh that the town or the setting of this kind of youth prison uh messing with her psychologically sure uh her sexual and romantic desires as well as kind of at the age of 24 feeling a little bit like 
her, her time is up almost uh, a little bit. So uh, that is the focus of the early film, basically until Hathaway gets introduced. Then it's this like again Hitchcock, mm-hmm. uh, almost dangerous romance but, to it, right. femme fatale. Kind but of we stuff. are driving toward the. But yeah, we're driving towards something. Yes. It is not something of just of we are walking in a day in the life of this person no, that no. happens to be things going on. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, and that slippery slope is very apparent by the end. And I would say a lot of why I enjoy this film so much is that it had a kind of a retroactive effect that you you sit with the ending and then it's like, oh, so much stuff falls into place. The dominoes all slip into place. Okay. So, oh, interesting. Okay. A little bit more about that tone, though. Noir, I feel, is largely about mood, most of all. It's how we, how we kind of uh, say it in a, in a gut check of what's noir and what's not. I think the soundtrack was a really, really strong at creating this unique atmosphere as well. Uh, Richard Reed Perry, uh, once again, no experience with, uh, has a storytelling aspect to his jazz pizza pieces here. While watching it, uh, I purely had just enjoyed it for the style, but listening after, the tracks all hint at the darker spin that plays out on screen. You know, honestly, it might be a tall order, but if you do watch this film, folks, which I will recommend for, my recommendation is to check out the soundtrack after the fact. Uh, I know that's that might be a tall order for some, but it really, I can't explain how much it enriched my experience. Um, and at least listening to the track leaving all the way through will kind of show you that these motifs, uh, the... The soundtrack throughout the entire film is always hinting at this darker spin, and I just really had a huge appreciation for it. Really excellent soundtrack. Wow. So, okay. Okay. Um, uh, again, Richard Reed Perry, uh, the director, the writer, no experience with. So this was a shot in the dark, and uh, maybe that plays a little bit into being surprised by it, and 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 that and that's playing into my positive reception of it. But I really think it was uh, excellently executed. It, yeah. It, 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 the film's being talked about a little bit because mm-hmm. of the performances. Yeah. I know Anne Hathaway's probably going to a lot of going to get a lot of uh, yeah, she love really for is great supporting in it. actress yeah. and stunning as well. But you know, it, this film is hitting on all these marks. I just wish that these these are the films we were hearing about more. You yeah. know what I mean? I yeah. wish we were hearing about this for months, but maybe could have some financial success. Sure, sure. Uh, which is I think very difficult to come by now. In the Neon uh, distributes it. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, last year Neon's big release was with uh, with Cronenberg for Crimes of the Future. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe Neon is just like there's not enough space in the A24 you know juggernaut uh, for uh, uh, Neon to kind of fit in a in a in a dark market in a kind of a twisted story market uh, of the of the films coming out. Yeah. I don't know. I think there's this revival because it's so difficult to make money now. Mm. Even like blockbusters, it's it's either a hit or not a hit at mm. all. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's, there's not much breaking even going on. Yes, you're yes. losing your ass or you're making a whole lot. Yeah. But there's this been this birth of like this thirty million dollar budget, forty million dollar budget. Yeah. You know yeah. that that's been going on even less in the horror it's, space. It's a yeah. lot easier to kind of um, get something going there. Yeah. And there's some bigger studios that are pushing this kind of stuff, and mm-hmm. I like that because that could be we can go back to kind of '90s early 2000s mm. when you could have these smaller stories it can be fi- financially successful and we actually care about this mm. stuff you know sure. what I mean but can actually make money we won't go into it too much more but just like you know once when DVDs went away mm. you need to make your that's why blockbusters became so huge mm. because that's how you have to make your money sure shifts in the market but now it seems like there's this other focus and more of a drive towards these smaller films I just wish they got presented to people more yeah absolutely you know? absolutely uh, and uh, unfortunately uh, something like this would be lost in the shuffle until it hits streaming and then probably lost in the shuffle on streaming right. as well right so um, you know, not to take a huge tangent towards that kind of stuff mm. but it seems like you're legitimately quite like this film oh yeah I, I thought this was great you hit the nail on the head uh, this is also in kind of uh, film history this is what we see happening in the 70s uh, and and what produced you know basically directors shaking things up right like a lucas you know mm-hmm, definitely uh, or like a scorsese so did you have trouble seeing this film no, but I didn't expect it to have as big of a release as it did, especially when I've been looking for poor things uh, with Emma Stone mm-hmm. all, all month, and it's like, uh, uh, where is it? You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Mackenzie's role is really deserved of a Best Actress nomination. I really enjoyed how much she was able to transform her usual soft-spoken mousiness 
and I don't mean that as an insult, but she's you know she's sure. a, she's a you know a tiny girl into something twisted and something dark. This movie feels good. How the first opening inciting incident of Psycho feels good. That's how I want to position wow. this film. Uh, plus, as much as I love some supporting roles, especially Anne Hathaway, the movie is such a spotlight and platform for Mackenzie directly that she gets to bake so much into the performance. Uh, I mean, she, it's the title character, title of the film, and for that reason, I mean, it just felt like a good platform movie to show the development of an actor and actress, and, and Mackenzie, I think, is is well-deserved of a nod here for uh, on the actress front, um, mostly Excellent. because... I don't know. We're uh, cats out of the bag. We're of course, you know, kind of prepping for um, Tom Danley's. I don't know who's in the running on the actress front. Of course, Margot Robbie. I was going to uh, say uh, Margot uh, in Barbie, but um, yeah, it's tough. So I think I think that once again, this movie was refreshing in that regard. That's good. Uh, hey, that, that all in for more great young. Mm. Up and comer female actresses. Yeah, yeah that goes I back mean, to for the male side too, but it, yeah. more. Give us more. Absolutely. And uh, uh goes back to conversations we had way long ago or now on the podcast of uh, where are our, you know, big, big stars, you know, coming uh, up. Yeah, we so. always go back to uh Florence Pugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know. And it, she's in she's in Boy in the Heron, yeah. so we'll get to it in <laughs> a second. Uh I think it's fair to say that the the pieces of this film might not sound groundbreaking. It might not have um a, a marketable energy. Uh, maybe maybe that's what Neon realized as well in the distribution of it. But uh, I was in love watching this. Once again, this week, my critique uh, boils down to it is all in the execution. This movie felt like a psychological yarn ball that as it unravels, it becomes messier and messier until it is out of control. Uh, I'll be honest, folks. I might catch flack whenever I have to actually cover some Hitch- some real Hitchcock movies <laughs> for some maybe some hot takes I have. But this movie felt like a wonderful take on an old fashioned thriller with teeth for the modern day. We're gonna go ahead and give Eileen a seventy eight. Seventy eight, a great score. It's always good to be in the high seventies. That's, that's a very good movie when you're at seventy eight. Absolutely. Wow, Eileen. I can't even I can't even find how many theaters it's actually in, which I can usually find pretty easily. Yeah. So, uh, Eileen, hey, if you guys are interested in something like that, it sounds like a great mystery thriller. Oh, honestly, yeah. really good. It sounds fantastic. Dark in all the right ways. It was great. And writing good mm. and acting good. Yep, absolutely. Uh, wow. Okay, I like that. I'm trying to think. By the way, the composer who you really liked, obviously, you like the music in the film. Mm-hmm. He's also the lead composer for the Iron Claw. Uh, oh, and, coming know, out next month, wow. basically from May 24. Yeah, that, that adds some excitement. So we'll see what uh, how that is behind it. But yeah. uh, also, I was thinking double header maybe for this film. <laughs> okay, <laughs> are you hit me with it. <laughs> okay, um, Winner's Bone with the young Jennifer Lawrence. Oh, uh, is it Winner's Bone? Yes. Is it? That, that's I double checked it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I always forget. I, oh, I thought it was Wind River. Is the Wind River is the other one by Taylor Sheridan? Oh, okay, okay. With uh, the Olsen girl, yes, yes, yes. and Jeremy Renner. No, yep. uh, Winner's Bone is the Jennifer Lawrence when she's okay. younger. I don't know if I've seen this actually. Uh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's surprising. Okay, because well, this is what this is also like. Oh, this watch out for this chick. Her her chops oh, are there. Really? She's not yet. Yeah, it's not like oh, she's just a she's just a face to be in this huge mm, franchise. Yeah, that yeah, is yeah. Uh, Hunger Games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she came out with this, and this did pretty well. But kind of a dark cloud of a story, mm. a bit, but very young female driven performance. Essentially, mm-hmm, is what mm-hmm. is what you're watching for. But okay, we'll just have to lay it down on the table. Yeah, yeah, I'll t- I'll so you pick that back up. I'll take that uh, <laughs> that wild stab of me understanding this movie, you understanding the other <laughs> movie. <laughs> but that, the, what is a doubleheader if not uh, a little bit of a hot take in itself? <laughs> <laughs> All right, 78 for Eileen, folks. Let's keep it moving here. So this is the big movie of the week. This was number one at the box office. Very weak box office this weekend, so mm. uh, nothing too great, but this is still a big deal. This is The Boy and the Heron, directed by Hayao Miyazaki. This is out of Studio Ghibli, which we can definitely get into a little bit. Mm. This mm. is the first time he ever got uh, number one at the opening weekend mm-hmm. in the U.S. Oh, wow, okay. This is getting a lot of U.S. recognition and being pushed out a decent amount yeah. now, as far as marketing goes. Oh, for sure. Uh, studio Ghibli, massive animation studio from Japan. Mm. Uh, five of the best t- of the top ten selling animated films in Japan. I can five imagine. of them alone come from Studio Ghibli. I can imagine. Uh, this was started by... 
uh, Miyazaki had started Studio Ghibli in 85, along with two other. Yes. Another director and a producer, I believe. Mm -hmm. Very well regarded as far as animation goes. The guy has a rich history as far as animation in general. Mm -hmm. And then Studio Ghibli starts in 85 and then just making some of the best films that there are. Yeah, absolutely. So I know you have a huge amount of love for Studio Ghibli, much more (laughs) than me. Uh, I am adjacent because of my friend group, essentially. (laughs) Why even know Studio Ghibli? Otherwise, it wouldn't be on your radar. So I'm definitely going to put the, you know, pass that ping pong back to you now. Uh, the, <laughs> Don't cut yourself short. You have some some uh, aggressive anime watches. Don't uh, If you need to earn some anime cred, you watch Paprika, which is Satoshi Kon. That's true. And, like, it's some serious shit. Paprika so. and Bakano. <laughs> Bakano, you can cut from okay. that. Bakano, I don't know if even a modern anime <laughs> watcher would ever recognize the name Bakano. And I was a Trigun fan growing yeah, Trigun's up a little bit. good. And Dragon Ball, because that's what was on American television. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, regardless, this is The Boy and the Hair on. Uh, yep. Miyazaki is 82 years old, so even though I understand that your big bugaboo is, he's constantly saying, mm. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Since 97. Then he gets back into the game. Some of his best performing films uh, have been... Post ninety seven too. Funny yes, enough. very true. Very true. Um, but we know we know Studio Ghibli. We know Miyazaki much from Howl's Moving Castle, Princess Mononoke. Yep. From uh, Spirited Away. Spirited Away was a big one. Kiki's Delivery Service. Sure. Poco What's it? Poco Poco Rosso. Poco Rosso. Yeah, you get a little uh, bit more obscure. That's good. <laughs> I'm liking it. <laughs> He's read up, folks. I wasn't even reading off Wikipedia. <laughs> but uh, anyway, a big time director. He's in the hearts. Of many, many people. Yes. So, especially in Japan, but more and more in the states as well. Yeah. So. If they uh, let me let me put it this way, I mean, last week I, I explained him as like kind of the uh, Scorsese of anime. Uh, if there was a Mount Rushmore of anime directors, Miyazaki would be uh, without a doubt uh, yeah. on there. So, so let's get into it right away. This is the Boy and the Heron. Like I said, I saw it as well. You saw it. Mm. Um, how did we like this latest film? Uh, well, let me start with saying uh, this has been a dynamite year for animation. I mean, 2023 can be seen as the year of horror, uh, seen as the year of, of action even, uh, and seen as a year for animation for mix of good and bad. But I feel like as far as quality goes, animation mm. might come out on King. We have Spider-Verse coming out this year. In this anime space, both Blue Giant and Suzume, great movies. And how even the Ninja Turtles movie uh, could... Oh, yeah, you could kind of like that. Yeah, you know, it, it could, all of them could easily be top animations for the year if in like a bubble mm. or... Or, yeah. you know, in, in their own realm. But uh, here comes Hayao Miyazaki out of retirement once again. And uh, by the looks of things, was going to have a killer film on his hands. I'm happy to say The Boy and the Heron is worth your time, much how many of Studio Ghibli's works rarely dip below a certain mark of quality. Mm. Uh, I feel like that's why the studio is so legendary, because you could honestly... Uh, almost choose any film that they've done and it's going to have uh, such a degree of heart and quality yeah, to yeah. its animation and care and detail that it's it, it never really dips below a certain degree but for those looking for one last masterpiece from Miyazaki myself included uh, I gotta say this film sadly falls a bit short in areas uh, okay uh, I did not uh, I, I it, does it dip below to where like Disney and Pixar have dipped with like elemental and wish this year <laughs> nowhere close strange worlds last year light sure. year from last right, year right yeah. exactly so I feel like we're far away from um, uh, from putting that in even in the same ring, uh, but uh, I feel like for the expectations of this film uh, and even how it was positioned with such a prestige cast and, and its marketing as Miyazaki's last you know uh, oh, emotional yeah. journey. Oh, big time! Uh, I feel like it, it really did fall short in, in, in a fair amount of areas. Wow. Uh, okay. So. Well, and and that's coming from you know number one fanboy over here. No, like, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So I have to say that the return of Papa Miyazaki. After so many retirements, uh, dulls what I love about his previous uh, quote unquote last film, 2013's Must Watch The Wind Rises. Part of why I love that movie so much is the story felt like it perfectly echoed the mindset 
of its creator, serving as a reflective narrative on what it takes to capture greatness and the fleeting effort of just trying to keep it. Hell, depending on where Ghibli films rank for you, I could imagine a similar feeling with 1997's Princess Mononoke, had similar hype that he was going to be done and retired uh, from filmmaking, <laughs> and the Oscar-winning 2001 Spirited Away, uh, both hyped up to be his last film as well. And uh, I feel like all three of those films serve... All three of those films are enriched by the idea of like, wow, he's he's really trying to tell something special here and right, get it all out. Because we think it's his last one. Right. I'll tell you what, it is crazy to think that he was he was toying with his last film idea <laughs> since 1997. 97. I mean, 26 years ago, right. really? Right. And we'll go through since 97. Let me just go through the films. Sure. Princess, Princess Mononoke, Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle, Ponyo. Yeah. Ariat. Uh, Arietti. Arietti. Mm-hmm. Uh, from Up on Poppy Hill. Yep. The Wind Rises and The Boy and the Heron. Now, so many of those films are huge, massive, mm, and yes. you love. I mean, so from you, Princess Mononoke. Good amount of them is must watch. I know. Site. You yeah. love Princess Mononoke, Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle. Those three you love. Ponyo yeah. not as hot on, but you liked. Sure, absolutely. Um, and a lot of people like that yeah, one as yeah. well. And then The Wind Rises, of course, you absolutely. Uh, I, I think uh, I'm, I may be in the outlier on this. I, no, I'm, I'm absolutely in the outlier on this uh, <laughs> just because it's not as fantastical. But I really do think Wind Rises is my favorite film of his. Which is a, so. that's it's very I don't know it, it surprises me for mm. some reason but mm. uh, I mean I love that it's yeah and this is his next that came out in 2013 yep uh, announced retirement and yep. then in 2017 already, I mean it's only like a four year mm. gap mm-hmm. in 2017 it was announced he's coming back for one more film mm. so yep. for six years we have been kind of waiting for this sure this film originally was announced to come out in the summer got pushed back yep and, um, and, and here we are so were you surprised sitting there how quickly with the film un- unfolding uh, did you find yourself feeling? Mm, oh, this is lacking. I don't know, or how, not feeling, should I say? <laughs> I don't know how much of a hot take I want to uh, want to do. I don't know. That's a that's a tough question. Uh, was in the first act. Uh, you were it, starting to get reservations. It, it was, yeah. It, 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 honestly, the mark for me is it was seeing some um, uh, some shortcuts taken in the animation with some 3D CGI. Uh, the uh, the inciting incident when you see uh, the firebombing of uh, of Tokyo, mm-hmm. uh, a topic that he has covered before in the past with Grave of Fireflies. It is, uh, let me tell you, I mean, breathtaking animation, and then. Moments after we see some corners cut with uh, CGI and like luggage and uh, some of the creatures as well, which okay. just is is not part of uh, Ghibli's pedigree for me. Uh, I think Ghibli is about hand drawn animation and blowing your mind with that hand drawn animation, right? Uh, with its crazy concepts and folklore and mysticism and where it can, yeah, where it can go, where yeah, it can take you exactly. So I, I think it's maybe unfair to say like I had. This you know, I had it called, I had it pinned. Early sure, on. yeah, yeah. Uh, also, you know, it, it, that that's not what the movie's about. I I think a lot of the discussion online in this movie is that the story is a little bit un- incomprehensible hmm. uh, and doesn't tie itself as strongly uh, to characters and the main story. Uh, but it's more about a feeling that you walk away with, mm-hmm. a resolve you walk away with, which I can get behind. Okay. So, so I guess what we should – we, we didn't set up the film yet, so I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll let you roll with it. <laughs> right, right. And then I'll have some opinions as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> with that in mind, I, I suppose my issue is that this new movie – comparatively doesn't have much to say, uh, which I don't want to knock this film for what it can be or whatnot, but The Boy and the Heron in a lot of ways feels like a rehash of the wonder and folklore we see in films like Spirited Away with more of a focus on the mystery than symbolism or just like crazy, crazy designs on screen. In the story, we follow a boy named Mahito uh, who loses his mother during the war and is forced to stay at a family family estate while right in smack dab in the middle of his grieving. Uh, the estate has a supernatural events uh, surrounded to it, seen only by his family bloodline. This leads a mischievous heron to harass Mont- Mahito, taunting him with the possibility his mother might still be alive. Uh, they both stumble into a reality where the line between life and death blur, helping this young boy come to terms with moving on. I would say the initial ramp-up introducing the fantasy elements are fairly slow. 
and nowhere near to the jump in the deep end most of these films can be. Uh, I, I think, for some reasons, that can be a positive for all the mainstream attention this is getting. Yeah. This is not going to freak people out uh, like so much anime does. <laughs> and so, much, <laughs> so much of a turnoff for mainstream audiences with anime. So that's a, that's a slight positive. The themes of grieving and sadness are mixed with the excitement of discovering this hidden world his family has access to. Though I believe that these two threads, they felt disjointed. Uh, the mystery of the hidden world has a whole story to tell around the creatures that inhabit it, how it exists, uh, and, 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 you know, uh, and even its own conclusion of what happens to this hidden world. But for large stretches of the runtime, it's not clear how it really concerns Mahito. Mm -hmm. It's not really also clear how it concerns... You know, his grieving process to it. Right. And that's where I felt even after those opening moments, I was like, oh, I, I, I kind of see where this is. <laughs> you know, I kind of <laughs> see where this is positioning itself for me. Uh, the discussion online, like I said, is around that while the story's mix with its fantasy is a little comp incomprehensible or it's a little muddy, it's, it's more about the feeling that you, you take away from it. Uh, I can get behind that, and honestly speaking, that's kind of every Ghibli movie as well. So that's the, the mm -hmm. again, the yeah. mark, uh, the, the, the floor that it doesn't dip below as far as the score goes and mm -hmm. as far as my reception of it. That's a film. good note, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how did, uh, on that disjointed note, how did you feel, uh, especially as a, a fairly new watcher of this, did the fantasy elements make sense to you? Did you feel it had cohesion? Yes. Um, I felt like it had cohesion for the entire reason that um, I thought is what at times can make a great anime, which is the fantasy elements. Mm. So it's fantastical fantasy, I would kind of put it as. Mm. And yes, in a way, that's, that's kind of why I'm there. Mm. You know what I mean? I know, like, you know. Take something like we just mentioned, like a paprika, sure. which is super oh, right. animated. That's deep end. <laughs> yeah, that's, fantastical that's, fantasy. That's diving zone. <laughs> but I know where these films can go, especially for for Ghibli yeah. can go. So I just feel like it comes with the territory. Mm. And I was surprised with kind of how long it took us to get into that yes. zone. Yeah. So we're definitely dealing with not at all and then very much in mm. these fantastical fantasy elements mm. kind of. I, w I did kind of have a question for you. So sure. just like how the movie starts, especially kind of that first act in – it's great for a wider, more international audience because mm. it doesn't throw you in the deep end right away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, as you said, you know, people won't be freaked out, as sometimes it can do. The problem is, is it too boring where it's too slow to keep people in? Sure. And, and that's – and OK, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, that's where I feel like there's, there's a little bit of a dis disjointed quality that – once we get into knee deep, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, or or waist deep into the 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 wild fantasy world that he he stumbles into, that this it's like this uh, life and death mixed reality. When it comes down to that, I it. it it didn't feel like the ramp up was leading towards that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it didn't feel like I, I don't know. When we were in it, it was just such a divide that that was the story. Go, uh, you know, prior mm -hmm. to what we're dealing with, this is our character Mahito. But once we get into that fantasy world, it's its own thing. Yeah, and it has and its own conclusion. So, and the, right, this is what I was thinking. Too. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you, you know, Ghibli like the back of your hand. Mm -hmm. So, for me, even being one of those kind of novice viewers coming mm -hmm. to this, which a lot of people are going to be new sure. to Ghibli kind of seeing this. Sure. It's, I would say, stick it out. Yeah. Like, it. the problem is, is by the time it gets into those fantastical elements, mm -hmm. that buildup was kind of so slow. Yeah, yeah. And you think it was just reading, leading to somewhere kind of generic or a story that you can't really care too much about. Yeah, yeah. It's tough then to be pushed mm -hmm. into that element of, oh, this is this is true. This is right, heavy yeah. hitter Ghibli. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the stuff on screen does take you to a certain place. Yeah. But when you start from that area, when mm -hmm. you start with such a slow ramp up, mm -hmm. it's 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 interesting. It because yeah. I was really I was getting nervous in the first twenty minutes. <laughs> oh, really? And I almost texted you when I was in the theater. <laughs> Because I was like, maybe maybe it's me. Maybe You're I am sure, not right. getting something. Or yeah, maybe yeah. because I haven't grown up with Ghibli right. and Miyazaki that like, oh, maybe you just have to be in the know. Maybe mm. you got to be on the team already <laughs> before <laughs> stepping into this film. Fair. So fair. honestly, it's good to hear that it yeah. was a little lackluster, especially those first 20 minutes, half an yeah. hour maybe for you. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and it's not that there's not quality in the slower moments of Mahito grieving. Yeah. Uh, or coming to terms and, and discovering the mystery of this estate mm -hmm. uh, that he can see these things uh, because he's part of the bloodline uh, I think there's there's quality there it just feels yeah. like there's too much
much of a 180 in when the film finally gets into mm-hmm. his fantasy. Yeah. So, yep. uh, and that's why disjointed was, was really the word I kind of came to with it. But no, I, I'm right there with you. And I, I worry that this doesn't wow audiences enough for the expectations of it for mm-hmm. someone that maybe hasn't given Ghibli films a shot. The, the theater reaction to some of this was, I had a horrible theater experience. Oh, with this. oh really? Yeah, yeah. There was a guy yawning like so obnoxiously. Like he was saying like, <laughs> he was <laughs> yawning in a way that he goes, <laughs> like, Just, yeah. like, shut up, dude. <laughs> right. like, what is that? And then there was absolutely a, an older couple in the back that clearly had some drinks or something like that and was just like so like, what is this? Oh, okay. <laughs> what is happening? And I, I don't know. I feel like this didn't communicate why – Ghibli is the goat. Yeah. You know what I mean? The, Why it, it's it, you know they are the greatest. It's a shame you know? because not only is it uh is it enough for mm-hmm. true fans like you, mm. uh it might be it also might not be enough for even newbies. Yes, right. Because of that rainbow. The problem is you get there eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for sure. what is going to be the engagement level mm-hmm. of those people coming into it for the yeah. first time? Yeah, exactly. So I, I would say I uh the, the English sub is definitely worth note. Uh yeah. I, I what yeah, what did you watch? English. Okay. English. Cool. Annoying though, trying to figure out a decent time. Mm. That's why I had to go to a movie tavern. Oh, because, because it's, right. the, the times were shit. They were they were simultaneously doing uh Japanese as yeah. well. So and I'll say right off the bat, mm. uh, I have been hardcore watch the non-dubbed hardcore i'm a big subtitle guy big subtitle guy Mm -hmm. uh this guy i forget what movie oh yeah i would have loved it more than napoleon Uh, (laughs) but for these films in particular for these animated films and ghibli films in particular yeah the voiceover work is so solid sure so solid absolutely Uh, you are safe to watch the dub yeah without a doubt absolutely and and so much of this uh uh this voice cast plays into its marketing it's it's kind of a larger prestige and a larger uh just just variety of voice casts uh, than ever uh, in these films i mean i think willem dafoe had like four or five lines in right this. right and you recognize it pretty pretty right away especially he, he like he, he plays like this like beat up pelican <laughs> as just like oh yeah, yeah that's that's dafoe <laughs> for sure he wanted to be like the weirdest you know bit character on screen <laughs> right. but i feel like it's absolutely in the dna of of yeah. why this movie is coming to the to the West and so much hype around it. I would say my my only like real highlight is Robert Pattinson uh, yeah. in, in playing the Heron himself, it's showing a big range for him as this like twisted bird creature. Uh, the Heron was also my favorite character, perfectly capturing some of the evil that is implicit in magical creatures of this world and a lot of Ghibli works that there's just kind of an indifference to uh, like human life, that they are like beyond it. Uh, mm-hmm. And it plays into that otherworldly element that was really great about the fantasy side about that. Uh, when, it, when it comes down to it, um, I didn't think that the English cast was bad, but I really didn't have any other highlights. I'm curious to see if any, anything else stands I thought out. everybody did a great job at what mm-hmm. they needed to be. I completely agree with you where Robert Pattinson was like unrecognizable mm. completely. For sure. I mean completely unrecognizable and yep. it was just – it was kind of, kind of cool to see. Yeah. If you didn't know going into it, it was Robert Pattinson, oh. you would, you would yeah. never guess at this guy. <laughs> right. Which I got to say, I mean I am so pro Pattinson. Yeah. And I he's... think he's kind of been – He's kind of been my guy for a little bit. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's here, though. It was, Ethan, Ethan Hawke just arrived. Robert Pattinson met him at the door. <laughs> yes. Um, even before the Batman, which I love oh, him. Oh, sure, Love sure. him as the Batman. Yep. But he was, in good, he was in good – some other stuff, too. But, uh, yeah, he, he was a great performance. Everyone else was just doing what they needed to do. Mm. I think uh, Florence Pugh, yeah. again, like with how young she is, she has that deep, just older person voice. Sure, in a good raspy. way. Raspy, yeah. Uh, I thought her character was great. Everyone did a fine job. Mm. Um, but it's it's – I feel like with what the characters were, just the script in general, yeah. it's hard to have like more standouts. I would say maybe the other one might have been like Dave Bautista. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, he, he plays like this mole general or something like that. No, oh no, 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 he, he was, was a parakeet. parakeet. Yeah, that's parakeet right. Parakeet general uh, yeah. or king parakeet, whatever. Yeah, uh, that was enjoyable. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, it's just a funny standout kind of. But otherwise, yeah. uh, everything was just very solidly done. Yeah. So it to have that seamlessness mm-hmm. uh, was it's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just just while we're on that note about some of maybe some of these these funnier characters when you get in that fantasy uh, don't get me wrong the film does hit a stride in the sense that i feel like 
kid audiences are going to love just like just the the usual Ghibli cuteness of it. You oh, know, yeah. the amount of parakeets that are in this and the the characterization of these birds and kind of the fascination with just like a lot of different birds in this uh uh just very cute uh and, and heartwarming yeah i was so. surprised that was peachy 13 yeah i think it might be dealing with some heavy tones maybe right but right. uh i don't know i would take a pretty young per- young kid to see this yeah yeah i think so i think so uh last but not least i want to touch on animation i already kind of did in, in the beginning um i would say this is something that i had very high expectations for as i'm sure every fan of the studio had as well ghibli is an animation house that often sets a new bar with its releases no less uh, after these you know these stints of retirement with miyazaki uh, occasionally there are some 3d models used on simple things like you know, like objects like luggage, luggage, I don't know why I, I, I zoned into that one, but it's a, a touch disappointing to see. Uh, not that I want to cut the work of an industry rapidly shifting to 3D animation, uh, but it felt like cutting corners a little bit for a studio that is known for... Again, hand-drawn masterpieces. Mm -hmm, Yeah. Um, This primarily affects our newest kind of forest spirit mascot creature, these little white blobs that look super cute for sure, but previously in Ghibli's history would be wonderfully hand-drawn. I, I of course, lean on the forest spirits, (laughs) you know, uh, in Princess Mononoke Mm. um, of just being same kind of cute vibe, same kind of, you know, mascot for the film. Uh, certainly, I imagine that plays into you know toy sales for Ghibli in Japan. But when it comes down to it, uh, I was just disappointed to see that that was yet another. It felt like a, a corner cut mm-hmm. a little bit mm-hmm. for it. Um, this is especially driven home in the highlights of animation of this film uh, around certain things like fire and smoke and crowds. Uh, once again, going back to those parakeets, the stunning over animation in these parts uh, was wonderful. The opening sequence, which is shown in the trailer uh, that you can check out at home, folks, is downright breathtaking in its fluidity and its motion and its panic. Uh, And it was, I I personally felt, in addition to like that slowness that we both experienced, I was just kind of waiting around in the movie to be stunned again by something of that quality. Uh, That's interesting. Obviously, I'm I'm a big animation nerd. Not right. everyone is going to see the film this way, but I think Ghibli kind of makes their own bed in expecting some of this as well, even for mm. uh, a more middle of the road audience. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Did did the three D so bother you at all? It, or it, it wasn't. I mean, I, I noticed that some things were off here or there, or mm-hmm. it was a new animation style. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I would be like most other viewers, where that's not gonna. Uh, it won't bother sure. t- too too much. Sure. The biggest thing I think Ghibli fans at heart and everything like that, I think it's going to take issue, and I think for good reason. Mm. My biggest thing with the animation was I feel like Ghibli's animation, and I mean, maybe this is just my just my uh, ignorance of it. I feel like their animation is super consistent, like mm-hmm. that hand-drawn stuff, mm-hmm. where whether I'm watching this or whether I'm watching something from them 25 years ago mm-hmm. kind of looks the exact same. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's, now, that's the, the hand of Miyazaki, right. I would say. And that's amazing yeah. and, and great. Mm-hmm. can also be bad sure. because maybe it doesn't feel like you're watching something new and fresh mm-hmm. visually. I can sure. see someone new stepping into this film mm-hmm. and being like, okay, this is something that matches 1985. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. There's mm-hmm. a there's an there's a greatness to that. You can watch every film and feel this connection, or you know, it magically doesn't feel aged, mm. but at the same time, does feel aged. Sure, it all sure. depends how you want to look at it. Yeah, um, we can maybe call that like a Wes Anderson syndrome, where the style becomes a little bit of a burden after being done so right, many times. Right, and I, I don't know where to really go with that, but mm. I do know that just watching this film and not knowing anything about it, would I say that it was made in 2023? No, mm, and I don't okay. know if that's a good thing or not. Interesting. Now, Interesting. one thing you said, um, uh, Studio Ghibli, you mentioned that per film they kind of perfect something or they can be a trendsetter in some way? Oh, absolutely. I mean, from... But not animation style. Um, not necessarily animation style, but sometimes animation techniques. Uh, a perfect example of this is one of the earliest films, Nausicaa. Yeah. Uh, they revolutionized how how intense cell... Uh, cell um, I don't know, actually, what the, the technical term for it, but how things were layered in the animation to achieve certain movement like of, fluidity. of creatures. Uh, yeah, fluidity absolutely. of characters, okay. Yeah. But still kind of, we, we're used to that hand-drawnness. Yes. They, they weren't perfect. 
affecting on this or anything like that. Like- uh, yeah, more so than I, I would say film to film, it feels like an arms race to do crazier and crazier concepts. A good example okay, of this yeah, is yeah. as well from Princess Mononoke, Japanese mysticism to it. Uh, you know, the, it's fantasy is breathtaking. You go then to four years later with Spirited Away. It's a kaleidoscope of that same mm-hmm, mm-hmm. degree of uh, of crazy designs and monsters and, and spirits. And okay. Like that's that. what you so, mean by building upon and kind of yes okay exactly uh it, in in maybe in lesser hands it would be too busy on screen mm. i feel like they set a bar because they make it so uh so palatable and so so breathtaking to look at okay very so. good yeah and i would say this is breathtaking palate definitely palatable yeah oh for sure and that was my big note on the animation though and mm-hmm. that was i was it was going back and forth in my head mm-hmm. where is it gonna feel old yeah and but that, could that also be a good thing or right. a negative thing does it feel fresh anymore does it not mm-hmm. certainly where he goes and yeah. this you know the funny thing was starting so slow it's you take a, a tarantino-esque turn <laughs> yeah. and you're saying like what's going on we, we got all the way here yeah you know <laughs> it's like a dust till dawn. Right. <laughs> like it's just like, wait, it's a different movie now. <laughs> so yeah, and maybe that's a positive for folks at home. Maybe uh, that aspect will kind of subvert some expectations as well. Um, I think the good news here is that though we are focusing on a lot of critiques, tuning the film down. Uh, I, I, I think um, it, it's again, it does not dip below a certain mark. On on last week's episode, like I said, I explained, in my mind at least, that Miyazaki is like a Scorsese of anime. But really what I mean by that is he's an auteur. That that is where the Mm -hmm. style comes into play, that it is Miyazaki. It's almost, you know, it's almost inseparable from uh, his style, from his, uh, from how he makes the films. Yes, Uh, (laughs) yes. I'm cracking a smile because you don't want to make, you don't even want to hear the comparison that I was thinking of. (laughs) Do it. Hit me with it. I'll take just like Michael Bay is. Oh, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Okay. We'll call. We'll meet in the middle and call it Wes Anderson syndrome. Okay. We'll meet. Uh... I could do. Or I was going to go. J.J. Abrams is okay, lens flare. Sure. Lens flare sure. is J.J. Abrams. I, I wouldn't call either an auteur, but. <laughs> I love that. That's great. <laughs> I I always love our hot takes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, folks, so while this review has a lot of critiques, it comes from uh, a place of expectation for greatness. And if anything, uh, my intro to Killers of the Flower Moon review should have maybe even be repurposed here. You know, I mean, Miyazaki is such a, a creative powerhouse, uh, such a, a brilliant mind, a creative mind that... Uh, really, uh, though there was aspects of this film that I feel were weaker than most, um, it still doesn't believe. Uh, it still doesn't dip below that bar. Uh, I want to let the score speak louder than my words for that reason, and um, that through line to the film has such a high degree of quality, care, and once again to this auteur piece, a personal element uh, in in every ounce of it. In my opinion, does it stand alongside the greats, quote-unquote, from Studio Ghibli? Ghibli? Not quite, Uh, but you can be sure this film has added to the incredible year animation has had in 2023. We're going to go ahead and give The Boy and the Heron a 72. A seventy-two, a very tame, tame score, and, and you know, a, a good score. Yes, a, okay. a seventy-two is a good score, and as far as just like for a film, yep. to get a seventy-two, that is a good movie, right? There. Absolutely, it's a pretty good movie. It's Absolutely. a seventy-two percent for us. Yeah. Problem is, is when you're coming, you know, it. This whole review might have sounded somewhat down yes, on the film, right? Right. But it's just because that's how heavy. Studio Ghibli is, or a heavy hitter, basically, they are. Again, look at the must-watches. Look at the scores of these films. Mm -hmm. Uh, They belong in a certain area, a certain pocket of our percent. So 72 might be low, still a good movie. Mm -hmm. Um, And expectation aside, that's where I feel like even within the movie – the word of disjointed comes to mind in that uh, in what it sets up for itself. Then, so excellent, excellent. So uh, I, I will say personally, I wasn't really in the. I kind of had to drag myself to the theater a little bit. Okay, I wasn't excited about this. Okay, fair. Uh, again, just me. I'm not the biggest Ghibli head. Right, whatever right, you guys yeah, call yeah. yourselves, or or anime. Right, whatever you guys, you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I did see it. I'm glad I saw it. But I, I went in not ex- expecting too much. I knew I was going to get a pretty good mm, film, mm-hmm. um, and I had the hope of greatness. You know, I, I did have a hope of maybe mm-hmm. this is something truly special, something yes. that can hit for so many audiences. Doesn't matter of what medium you're watching, meaning anime, you know, or animation for mm-hmm. sure. 
I didn't really feel the need to give this. Oh, a two, here we go. I didn't feel the need to give this a two shoes. I was impressed by some things. I thought yeah. the beginning was a little lackluster. I mean, we talked a decent amount already, so you have a better, a pretty sure, decent yeah, idea where I'm coming from. Yeah. Um, the reason why I will give it a two shoes mm. is the overarching theme of the story. And mm-hmm. although I think it's, I, th- I thought at the time it was dribbled out and maybe I was just searching for this theme. Mm-hmm. I think the more reflection I have on it, the more kind of it is beautiful. It is this story is so much about a perseverance, mm. uh, but it's really about taking up uh, responsibility mm. and doing things that necessarily you don't want to be even driven to do good and mm. to keep going, basically, and an over overarching theme of life and um and it's just when i say it's a very pro-life film i Mm. don't want that to be caught up in like modern day politics right right pro-life but it's extremely pro-life in the sense of an 82 year old japanese man reflecting on life (laughs) (laughs) there's elements all throughout it and uh i I found that to be touching and again the more thought i have on it Mm. the more of the themes that i really have come to appreciate Mm. i think the telling of the story is really well Mm -hmm. whether it's lackluster in this way or you're expecting more in this way Mm -hmm. uh for sure i can be in that camp the beginning of it being, am I, uh oh, am I wrong? Am I not getting something? Do mm. I just not get Studio Ghibli? Sure, the, to the, the end being the fight like, or flight. <laughs> I walked out, didn't have a huge smile on my face, wasn't blown away, wasn't right, wowed, right. overly wowed. Um, but the overarching theme with its characters and the way the film ends up going, it's, um, I just, I do want to give an extra nod to. Mm. And I do want to give a Tommy Two Shoes where I was hoping to be in the potential two shoes, two laces, oh, all sure, time. Oh, sure, right, right. Um, this gets two shoes and no laces. Okay. For that, I think it's, it's, it's kind of close to your 72, maybe a little bit below that. Sure, sure. I just don't think it's quite there. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly the theming and the tones of the overarching ideas of the film, I absolutely love. Mm. So, And well that, said. Well said. Yeah. I, I like I like what you said is specifically around kind of the story is about forcing yourself to do what is necessary and responsible, but something that you kind of don't want to do, you know? Right. Uh, I, I think that really hits the nail on the head. Well said. And at the end, you can also – it's funny because it would be fun to talk to you later about this mm-hmm. because you can also say the exact opposite actually is where the film mm-hmm. goes at one point. Sure. But the I think overarching, it's about just doing, mm-hmm. you know, taking up the responsibility you didn't think that you would have to. Mm. I love that. And that search just for life and everything. It's just just fantastic in that realm. Yeah. So, but otherwise, two shoes, no laces, you know, people, people, th- <laughs> it seems like nobody knows what the shoes mean. So that, <laughs> that means to whatever you want it to mean. <laughs> so, but that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> you don't See, understand. To me, in my head, it makes total sense. Sense. Yeah, right. The touch on the shoes. By the way, someone bitched about it to me, and then I was, I was like, "Well, it's like stars." And if you have this, and I thought, "God, that's a, that's a great idea. That was great what I just did. It's just like stars." For me, I literally put it in percentage form, <laughs> right. and it gets so confusing. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's where that stands. Two shoes, no laces. Oh. A seventy-two percent for you, Vin. Uh, who is this movie for? This is going to be in theaters for the next few weeks. Um, is this for anybody? People who don't really like animation or what we consider, oh, that's just a kid animation film mm. or whatever. I don't know this Studio Ghibli. Is I, it for people out there? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I, I think it, uh, especially with the holiday season, this might hit as a, uh, not like a Christmas movie per se, but a family movie. Yeah, uh, definitely. And, and especially how cutesy uh, like the parakeets can be and the, and the blobby creatures, the forest spirits and whatnot. But uh, as well, I, I say let the, let the cast speak for itself. If you are interested in anyone in that cast and especially Robert Pattinson, Give it a shot. You know what I mean? I think voice acting wise is uh, is an interesting highlight for the okay. film. Okay. Excellent, Vin. All right. Thank you so much, Vin. Is there any uh any closing notes or roll credits here? <sighs> no, no. We, we we are we're almost done with December, but uh uh it's just head down. It's head down, get the I, movies I mean I done. love it. I'm glad we have great movies. <laughs> yes. You know, at yes. the beginning of the of the year, so such a slog. Right. To and get, and to the beginning of next well, year as well. To get through January and February, but <laughs> Some movies that we're actually excited for. You yes, know what I mean? They're yes. not all Aquaman 2, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is good to see. But anyway, we definitely ran long here. Vin, thank you so much for watching these films. Thanks for stopping by here tonight. Folks at home, we're going to run it down one more time. We have Paris, Texas with a 48%. If Beale Street could talk with a massive 86%, that's a must watch. We have Leave the World Behind with a 62 Eileen with a 78 and The Boy and the Heron with a 72%. Folks, thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next week with another big week here on the Daily Ratings Podcast. Hey, if you enjoyed the podcast, if you would, give us a good rating or tell a friend about us. If you're wondering if a film is worth a watch, or if you just have to see more movie ratings from Vince, 
Be sure to stop by thedailyratings.com, where we have our ever-expanding catalog of films. Also, if you found value in this podcast or our site, become a producer and go to the Donations tab on thedailyratings.com. You can donate whatever amount of value you feel you receive from us. We're looking to build this into something large and great, folks, but we want to be independent from those corporate sponsors. So we greatly appreciate any support from you all. So thanks so much, and we'll see you next time on the Daily Ratings Podcast.